a hearing on suppressing forest fires. Yesterday, a House Resources Subcommittee heard from the General Accounting Office, Virginia Department of Forestry, Agriculture Department, and others on ways to prevent forest fires. Idaho Representative Helen Chenoweth calls this two-hour and 50-minute hearing to session. Yes, we have a bunch. She's bringing us the uh, Subcommittee on Forest and Forest Health will come to order. The subcommittee is meeting today to hear testimony on fire suppression. Under Rule 4G of the committee rules, any oral opening statements and hearings are limited to the chairman and the ranking minority member. Um, and this will allow us to hear from our witnesses sooner and help our members keep to their schedules. Therefore, if other members have statements, they can be included in the hearing record under unanimous consent. This subcommittee has held several hearings on wildfire issues, usually with the focus on forest health conditions and forestry practices. But today, we're going to take a close look at the activities surrounding firefighting itself, mostly from the aspect of interagency coordination and cooperation. How well do the various state and local agencies work together, and how well do they work together with the, with the federal agencies? who is responsible for staffing levels, employee training, fire forecasting, equipment availability, and all other aspects of wildfire preparedness and suppression. We will examine that today, as well as what did we learn from our experiences in the state of Florida. These are the types of questions that we'll be exploring today, and I'm very happy to welcome to this committee my colleagues, uh, Corrine Brown and Alan Boyd, who are both here from uh, representing their good state, the state of Florida, who has uh, just recently experienced the devastating fires down there. So we are very happy to, uh, to welcome them and concentrate today on uh, focusing on what happened in Florida. This is an extremely important and timely topic for a number of reasons. Because it represents a huge cost to the American taxpayer, for one, the GAO reports that federal land management agencies spent over $4 billion in the last five years in firefighting activities. And this doesn't include the military costs of borrowed personnel and equipment, the costs of to, the, to our states, uh, or the costs to, uh, in regards to the loss of private property. This issue is important, however, not just because of the cost in terms of dollars, but for the costs in terms of wildlife uh, habitat that is lost, and most importantly, for the loss of human lives, which we have experienced in the West in firefighting. We have a moral responsibility to make sure that we are doing absolutely everything we can to effectively prepare and fight wildfires, and I am looking forward to working with the agencies in this regard. I will depart from my normal um, procedure here, and I'd like to uh, recognize, uh, uh, with, uh, without uh, objection, I'd like to recognize Mr. Boyd and, uh, and Ms. Brown for any opening comments that they may have. Good morning, and thank you, Madam uh, Chairperson, for holding this meeting. Uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to, test to offer testimony today. As you know, Florida has suffered from disaster wildfires, the worst that we've had in 50 years. More than 500,000 acres have burned in Florida over the past two months, and it, the economy impact has been incredible. Firefighters from across the country mobilized to help us out in Florida, and we are very grateful for their efforts. Let me also say that the coordinated effort was exceptionally. I know that there were many nights that the agency chief didn't even begin to conference with each other until 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning, and I talked to several of them during that time. Uh, they did a yeoman's job, and we in Florida are proud that all of the agencies were so successful. For the purpose of this morning hearing, I have contacted <coughs> several of the fire chiefs from Florida who know best about how the response to their nature, natural disaster actually work. Though I would like to submit my full remarks for the record, 
I would like to take this opportunity to highlight some of the issues that they have raised to me. For the most part, the fire chief said that the coordinated between local, state, and federal agencies was exceptionally, worked exceptionally well. This was by far the most common response I've heard. There were very few problems they shared, but those that they shared, I will share with you today. It appeared that the number one problem involved communications between all of the parties involved. There was no communication link established specifically for the firefighters' efforts. So we had many firefighters carrying several radios at a time in order to maintain a line of communication. My understanding is that each department worked with equipment that was not compatible. So there was no single frequency to use. Another problem involved liability. I understand some of the firefighters brought in from other parts of the country was actually not allowed to assist because they didn't have a red card, which can only be received after a week-long training session. I was told that most of the firefighters participating didn't hold this particular card. Also, the most useful resource was the helicopters because they saved valuable time, though there were not always enough helicopters on hand. This was a resource most in need. Finally, because it was always the local team that respond for the first several hours to any emergency, there is a big need for additional training and resources at this level. I've heard from several chiefs that more direct funding to local communities to better prepare for these emergencies would be beneficiary, benefit the communities. Many of our local firefighters had to fight the wildfires in gears that was made for structural fires. This caused a frequent occurrence of heat exhaustion for many of our firefighters who didn't have the light gear to fight the fire outside. In closing, I would like to say that our firefighters were, for the most part, pleased with the U.S. forestry and Gra incredibly grateful for the nationwide assistance. Uh, thank you for the time and the attention that you're providing uh, this morning for this meeting, and I have a more lengthy uh, comments that I would like to submit uh, to the record. Without objection, so ordered, and I thank you, Ms. Brown. Those were very interesting comments. Um, Chair now recognizes Mr. Boyd. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairman. Uh, I would like to uh, submit for the record uh, my opening statement, which is a more lengthy than the one that I'll give orally. Without objection. So ordered. Madam Chairman, first of all, I want to thank you and the other members of this subcommittee for again allowing me the privilege of sitting as a part of this panel and participating in this hearing. I'd also like to thank you for calling this oversight hearing on federal fire suppression activities and efforts, which obviously as uh, Ms. Brown has stated, is a very timely issue in our state due to the recent wildfires that have, have affected Florida. As my colleagues are aware, the state of Florida has recently experienced a series of wildfires that burned over half a million acres, destroyed uh, over 125 homes, timber, and property with an estimated dollar value loss of near $400 million. Now, unlike Ms. Brown's district where most of the fires were on private land and or state land, in the second congressional district, uh, which I represent, a majority of the affected, affected acreage is on federal lands. District 2 has the entire Apalachicola National Forest within its borders and also encompasses part of the Osceola National Forest. The wildfires have burned thousands of acres of timberland within these national forests. And the reason I'm here today is to listen to these panel experts about uh, suppression efforts and activities. Uh, I would be remiss if I did not, at this point, uh, express the gratitude of all the people of the state of Florida for the efforts made on their behalf to put out the fires by firefighters from all over this nation. There wasn't a Friday that I went home into the district through the airport, uh, my airport in Tallahassee, uh, in which I didn't bump into uh, dozens and dozens of firefighters coming in from all over the country. This happened probably six or seven weeks in a row. And I want the rest of the country to know how grateful we are uh, for uh, your assistance in coming and putting out those fires, else our damage would have been much greater. I look forward to the testimony of our witness to, witnesses today, and I believe that uh, working together we can take another policy step 
uh, in our stewardship of our wonderful natural resources. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Boyd. Um, I am certainly pleased that you can join us here today because uh, we've tried to take numerous steps to try to prevent the kind of catastrophe that we saw in Florida and have seen in California in the past. So I welcome your participation. Thank you very much. And now I'll introduce our first panel. And the, the chair welcomes Mr. Barry Hill, Associate Director of Energy Resources and Science Issues for the General Accounting Office. Office. And Mr. Hill is accompanied by Linda Harmon, Assistant Director, um, Energy Resources and Science Issues, also from the GAO. Uh, now, as explained in our former hearings, uh, it is the intention of the chairman to place all outside witnesses under the oath. This is a formality of the committee that is meant to assure open and honest discussion and should not affect the testimony given by witnesses. I believe all of the witnesses were informed of this before appearing here today, and they have each been provided with a copy of our committee rules. Now, if the witnesses, uh, Mr. Hill, um, and, and Ms. Harmon, if you'd please stand and raise your arm to the square. Do you promise and affirm under the penalty of perjury that you will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. Mr. Hill. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, we're pleased to be here once again uh, before this subcommittee and to have the opportunity today to discuss wildfire activities and expenditures of the major federal land manage management agencies, that being the Forest Service, the Bureau of Land Management, the National Park Service, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and the Fish and Wildlife Service. If I may, I'd like to briefly summarize my prepared statement and submit the full text of my statement for the record. Without objection, so ordered. First, let me discuss the amount of funds spent on wildfire preparedness and suppression activities, and then I'll discuss the assistance provided to state firefighting efforts. Federal land management agencies spent about $4.4 billion on wildfire activities for fiscal years 1993 through 1997. Of this amount, $2.1 billion was spent for preparedness and $2.3 billion for suppression. Wildfire preparedness activities are those actions taken before the onset of a wildfire. These activities include providing fire management programs through training, planning, staffing, and providing firefighting equipment. Wildfire preparedness also includes programs to reduce flammable materials on the forest floor, such as fallen trees and dry underbrush. As you can see from the chart on my immediate right, Total expenses for wildlife preparedness increased during the period from $371 million in fiscal years 93 to $483 million in fiscal year 97. During this period, the Forest Service spent the most, $1.4 billion, followed by the Bureau of Land Management at $350 million. The largest preparedness expenses were for personnel, $1.2 billion while the second largest expense category was for services and supplies, $541 million. Suppression activities include actions taken to put out wildfires, including the use of firefighting personnel and equipment. For fiscal years 1993 through 97, the land management agencies spent about $2.3 billion on wildfire suppression. Uh, as shown by the uh, other chart that we brought, Wildfire suppression expenditures vary greatly during the period, depending on the number and intensity of wildfires in a given year, and range from a low of $187 million in fiscal year 1993 to a high of $858 million in fiscal year 1994. Of these five federal land management agencies, the Forest Service spent the most on wildfire suppression for this period, about $1.7 billion followed by the Bureau of Land Management at $360 million. The largest expense category was for services and supplies, about $1.2 billion, while the second largest expense category was for personnel at $941 million. Now allow me to discuss federal assistance to states. 
For fiscal years 1993 through 97, the five land management agencies provided assistance to state and local firefighting efforts through cooperative agreements, provided grants valued at $83 million, and loaned excess federal property worth about $700 million. The activities covered by these grants and cooperative agreements include fire prevention, environmental education, training, and developing procedures for fighting fires. The Forest Service administers two grant programs that provide funds to states for wildfire preparedness activities, the Rural Fire Prevention and Control and the Rural Community Fire Protection Programs. Both programs are matching programs that is, the entities receiving the grants must match them in dollar amounts or in-kind contributions. For fiscal years 1993 through 97, the Forest Service provided a total of $69 million to the states through these two programs. The Forest Service also manages the Federal Excess Personal Property Program, which loans excess federal property to state and local firefighters. The types of excess property range from shovels to helicopters. Most of these, this property are trucks that can be readily converted to tankers or pumpers. Other common items loaned include generators, pumps, fire hoses, breathing apparatus, and personal protective clothing. During fiscal years 1993 through 97, the Forest Service loaned excess federal personal property valued at about $700 million to states for use in wildlife preparedness activities. Uh, Madam Chairman, this concludes my statement, and we'd be more than happy to respond to any questions that you or other members may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Hill. Um, the chair yields to uh, Mr. Boyd for questions. Thank you very much, um, Madam Chairman. And uh, just a, a couple of questions to clarify what we have before us. Mr. Hill, uh, the, the chart that you have uh, closest to you there the preparedness uh, s portion of that, uh, uh, I assume, is uh, fire prevention activities such as uh, uh, prescribed burning, any other kinds of activities. Uh, would you be uh, prepared to, to go into a little more detail about that, or would I, would I need to ask somebody from the Forest Service? Well, I can tell you a little bit about it. I don't have a breakdown of those expenses, unfortunately. The, uh, the agencies couldn't provide us that data. But it would certainly include planning, staffing, uh, putting equipment in place, uh, and it would also include some fuel management uh, efforts as well. Prescribed burning. That's right. All right. Do you derive anything from this uh, in terms of uh, money spent on the preparedness side compared to uh, what you have to spend on the suppression side? Uh, is there any, uh, ob obviously the numbers of fires that we have are, are, are directly related to the weather and other activities, primarily weather, uh, but do you derive anything from the figures in terms of relation between preparedness and then losses or suppression, cost of suppression? Well, as, as you can see, um, the preparedness, uh, there's, there's more stability. There's been an increase over the five-year period, uh, and, and that reflects you can, you can kind of plan for those level of activities a little bit better than uh, for the suppression costs, which basically you're at the mercy of Mother Nature there. Uh, you have good, good fire years and bad fire years. Uh, and as you can see by the other chart, uh, 94 and 96 were particularly bad fire years, which would drive those suppression costs up. Uh, but there has been uh, an increase over that five-year period, period for the preparedness costs, which shows you that uh, there are increased efforts at uh, fuels management and uh, prescribed burns in order to uh, reduce the risk of catastrophic fires, which drive the suppression costs up when they do occur. And then, Mr. Hill, I assume then that uh, your, your conclusion would be, uh, and, and obviously it's not very too, too scientific, too scientific, but uh, that when we have uh, done a better job of preparedness, uh, the suppression costs uh, go down, which uh, they have appeared to do over the last uh, eight, four years anyway. Well, there's, there's no question that the more you can do on the uh, preparedness pre-suppression end of it, uh, the better off you're going to be in terms of, of minimizing um, the, ca the catastrophic fires. Uh, but I, I should say that uh, uh, the inventory of, of, of fuel that's, that's on the floor now, I think the Forest Service estimated that 39 million acres 
uh, that needs fuel management efforts. Uh, so there's still a lot to be done on that front. Thank you. Madam Chairman, one more question, if you might indulge me. Certainly. Uh, there, there are no figures here on rehabilitation efforts uh, after wildfire. Uh, do you have anything that you might share with us on uh, rehab efforts and the cost of that? They would certainly be included in uh, the suppression uh, figures. That's part of the suppression cost. I don't have any uh, on hand. I'll, I'll defer to, to uh, Ms. Harmon here and see if she has any information. Uh, what we have... Well, well, i tell you what, why don't we just wait for her statement, Madam Chairman, and we'll ask no, that but question her. She, 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 she won't have okay, a statement. Okay, but, maybe it'd be time for you to answer that. Ms. Okay. Okay, what we have from the Department of the Interior, which does not include the costs associated from the Forest Service, for the period of 93 to 97 was approximately $52 million. And rehabilitation, uh, reforestation? Right, that would, be, that would be included in the suppression costs. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Boyd. And we will return for another round of questions if you have them for the GAO. Mr. Hill. Uh, your staff is also in the process of doing a pretty comprehensive evaluation on the question of forest health conditions as related to many things, but um, fire uh, suppression and fire preparedness and um, so forth. But based on your preliminary observations, do you see um, a continuation of current fire trends and the associated costs in in fighting the fires that we've had to deal with in the last seven years? It's, it's certainly hard to predict that because a lot of that is dependent upon uh, the weather conditions that you're going to face. But certainly that trend seems to be uh, continuing. And uh, the trend is caused by years and years of suppressing uh, natural wild, wildfires, uh, which uh, in the past seven or eight years, um, the federal land management agencies have come to realize that uh, uh, that perhaps was not the best fire management, wildfire management uh, technique to be using. Um, so there's a lot more of the um, prescribed burns, mechanical clearings, efforts to reduce the fuels that are laying on the uh, forest floors right now, particularly in the western portion of the country, uh, which seems to have the biggest buildup of those uh, fuels on the floor right now. Mr. Hill, your charts are, are very interesting and certainly very telling. Um, we've also heard the number $4.4 billion for the overall expenditures um, over the last five years. In your best sense, how accurate do you really think the figures are that we're, we're using? Are you able to get the information that you need to give us an idea about how much is really being spent under these emergency conditions? I can't say I have a lot of confidence in those numbers. The numbers we're presenting are the numbers that we were provided and are, are obtained from the federal land management agencies themselves, and we have not had an opportunity to verify that data. Uh, I think it's further complicated by the fact that uh, when you have these joint cooperative efforts and uh, the federal and state and local um, uh, governments are sharing equipment, sharing resources, and basically, whatever able bodies you can have go in there to fight these fires, it's sometimes difficult to sift through the costs uh, and, and come up with some firm figures. Well, how accurately do you think um, they are monitoring the costs? And what do you think we can do to help you be able to, to get a better understanding of, of the exact costs? What needs to be done in terms of the kind of expenditures that are made during these emergency conditions um, in terms of analyzing cost? Well, I think it's uh, important to take a look at what is the process that both the Forest Service and the Department of Interior use to expend some of the money. What are their contact, contracting procedures are there enough controls in place to ensure that the proper costs are being recorded and being reported? Now, so far, we really haven't done any work in that particular area, but I think that would be something that would be very important, is taking a look at what are the processes and then how are the funds being expended by the various agencies. That's a, 
that particular subject is of great interest to me, so I look forward to working with you on that. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Hill, in your opinion, are the land management agencies spending sufficient resources on wildland fire programs? And are they, in your opinion, ex expending them efficiently? Um, it, it's hard to give a, a concrete answer on that. We really did not uh, audit or assess uh, the adequacy of the spending levels. And it's also particularly hard uh, when you consider the total costs involved uh, in, in wildfire, uh, in, including the preparedness activities and, and suppression activities, as well as the fuel management and rehabilitation costs. Um, what we, what we do know is, though, that uh, there, there does seem to be a problem with, with, with the fuels, fuel loads on, on the, the forest floors, and, and Congress has responded, uh, in, in all fairness, to that by increasing the appropriations uh, provided uh, over the last five years. Uh, and the land management agencies continue to increase their efforts um, uh, on, on the pre-suppression pre front, uh, fronts. Uh, however, when you want to determine the adequacy of funding, you really, as uh, Ms. Harmon mentioned, you really do have to look at uh, how efficiently and effectively they're spending the money in terms of uh, contract services, personnel, equipment. Uh, what are they deploying? Where are they deploying it? When is it being deployed? Um, it's a difficult question that certainly warrants uh, uh, further investigation. Well, along that line of thinking, Mr. Hill, does the federal government train the local and state firefighters? Are they involved in that training and, and uh, preparedness aspect? Um, the federal government works with the state uh, and they put on national firefighting uh, uh, training courses. Um, uh, th they've established a committee in which um, uh, the state participates. Uh, these courses are put on at a national level and uh, the states do send uh, their, their, their uh, staff to attend these courses. But they do reimburse uh, the, uh, the federal government for the full co cost of the training. Uh, however, I might mention that um, uh, they're allowed to use the grant money uh, to pay for some or all of these training costs. The chair now recognizes Mr. Schaefer from Colorado for questioning. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I have a um, number of questions. Just in terms of the mechanics of, of uh, suppressing and, and putting out forest fires and protecting uh, human life and property, in the aftermath of these forest fires, what kind of exchange takes place between uh, your operation and uh, the Forest Service as a whole with respect to management issues? Are there lessons we learn in fighting fires that help us, uh, help us with respect to management? I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure. I understand your question in terms of GAO's um, uh, feedback that we get from the federal land management agencies after they fight. You, you mentioned, for example, the fuels uh, fuels buildup issues right. and so on. What happens with that kind of information if you if we're able to determine, for example, that a uh, that, uh, that management and reduction in, in potentially hazardous fuel levels has a financial benefit to the American people from a suppression perspective? Um, what happens, is that information, you know, is, is it uh, packaged or compiled in a way that is useful for, for land managers within the Forest Service? And then I guess the secondary question is, in your estimation, is it ever utilized in any effective way? I really can't give a firm answer to that. We haven't looked at the program uh, in, that, in that depth, but I can tell you they do go through a, a planning process where they consider, they, they, they run various models based on um, uh, fires that have occurred, uh, fuels that are on the ground, uh, and they, uh, their, their, their budget requests and, and uh, the, the equipment and the staff that they deploy are based in large part upon these, these uh, yearly plans that they put together. Now, how adequate those plans are, we haven't really investigated that at this point. Uh, l l let me ask then, um, in terms of an assessment of preventable expenditures, of, of what could have been saved through sound forest management practices and so on, has GAO ever taken any any kind of uh, look at, at uh, what, which fires may have been preventable, uh, how much might have been saved if, we'd have if we had been able to successfully prevent forest fires from occurring on, in, in the aftermath, again, in the aftermath of analyzing um, uh, certain, uh, certain fires uh, that may have occurred recently. GAO has never done that to my knowledge. Uh, you might want to direct that question, though, to uh, the Forest Service and Interior uh, people. 
Um, let me ask, um, in, a report, in your report and in your testimony, you indicated that the Forest Service manages the federal excess property program um, that, uh, that loans excess federal property to state and local firefighters. Does the Forest Service have adequate controls over this equipment to ensure that it knows how much equipment is loaned to which states? And is it able to get the equipment back when the states no longer need it? Um, we're, we have not looked at the specific controls they have in place with regard to this particular program. Uh, it should be noted, though, that um, uh, they have had difficulty in, they, they have had it in the past and currently have difficulty um, in terms of their, uh, the adequacy of their controls uh, over inventory and accounting of property, plant, and equipment. Uh, whether this particular excess property is included in that category or not, uh, we're uncertain at this time. Uh, here again, I would, I would if I, you should ask that question to the uh, Forest Service officials. Uh, but, but they have had difficulty and continue to have difficulty accounting for all their uh, plant property uh, and uh, inventory. Let me, let me go back to the previous question that I asked and uh, try it from somewhat of a, of a different angle. Um, and that is that just when it comes to suppression costs, it varies pretty greatly from, or widely from year to year. Um, is, there, uh, is there any way to, have you been able to, to uh, determine any way or statistically uh, discover any methods that might be utilized in stabilizing these costs over a, from a year-to-year -year period? Well, I think the greater the investment you, you make in the pre-suppression area, uh, the preparedness area, in terms of reducing that fuel uh, on the ground, um, then the, the, the better chance you have of avoiding the, the large catastrophic fires. Uh, I think we have learned over the last seven to ten years um, that uh, uh, these forests uh, wildfires are a natural occurrence in, in our na uh, nation's forests, or in any forest for that matter. Uh, and if you uh, uh, suppress them or, or pre-suppress them to the point where you don't have them, then you create a dangerous situation so that when you do have a fire, it is a large catastrophic fire that destroys the forest. Uh, so the more you can do uh, in the, in the pre-suppression preparedness area in terms of clearing out that fuel, um, th hopefully the, the more control you'll have over the suppression. You know, that, that issue is, is really seems to be a key one in my mind. Um, if there has not been any assessment of what we might save through sound forest management practices, removing excessive fuel buildup, um, not just in the operational cost but also in the resource cost ahead of time, in many other areas of, of government, we're able to take legislation to the floor or a proposal in a committee, for example, and have some idea of what the taxpayers may realize in savings if we take a certain preventative action up front. Um, and I, it sounds to me like there has been no analysis on that basis, at least as far as GAO is concerned. What would it take in your mind to, uh, to, to move that process forward? Well, I think you're going to have to get a good assessment as to just what the situation I is in our nation's forests. Uh, and uh, here again, we have not looked at what, uh, what the Forest Service and the other federal land man management agencies have already done. We know there's a problem out in the interior west, uh, eastern Washington, eastern Oregon, Idaho, uh, western Montana. Uh, th there, there's a sig significant problem out there that, uh, that they're trying to deal with. Uh, on the other hand, I think uh, the southeast has been dealt with um, uh, perhaps a little more effectively in terms there's been more um, pre-suppression activities that have occurred down there that have uh, prevented uh, uh, major fires. Obviously, Mother Nature doesn't always cooperate as witnessed by the fire that, was, uh, that occurred in Florida recently. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer. Um, you're comments were very interesting, Mr. Hill, and I do think that it's, it's a very interesting time that we're living through, certainly the urban interface with the wildlands areas uh, are something that we need to look at very, very carefully because uh, these were the areas that Ms. Brown specifically referred to where there is a greater potential in losing private property, homes, and a threat to human life. Um, while we were fortunate in, in Florida not to lose lives, Mr. Boyd uh, 
indicated in his opening statement that there were 125 homes lost. And in recent California fires, there have been hundreds and hundreds of homes lost. And so I know that you're involved, the GAO is involved in doing a much greater in-depth study, especially based on what we are all learning here today. And uh, I hope that we can concentrate first on that uh, urban wildland interface. And then, uh, of course, moving into the situation where weather conditions, drought conditions, uh, rainforest conditions, typical geographic conditions will lend itself to either protecting uh, an area from devastating forest fires as well as the fuel load on the forest floor. Um, or preventing them through, through mother, mother Nature's conditions. Uh, certainly, Florida was, was ripe for that, and I look forward to hearing from our state forester from, from Florida. But uh, based on, on what we're hearing today, Mr. Hill, um, I do look forward to working with you and, and putting uh, our entire staff at, at your, um, if, if you need them, just call. <laughs> because this is, a, uh, this is a very, very important issue to us all, and I believe it's a very important national issue. I always appreciate your good work, Mr. Hill, and I thank you for being with us. And Ms. Harmon, uh, thank you very much. So with that, I'll recognize the, uh, the second uh, panel, which is only one witness, but uh, we have been looking forward to hearing from uh, Mr. James Garner, the state forester, um, Virginia Department of uh, Forestry in uh, Charlottesville, Virginia. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Garner, welcome. Um, as is normally uh, the situation here, and as was explained in our, in our, to our first panel of witnesses, we normally uh, ask our witnesses to be sworn in. So I wonder if you might stand and raise your hand to the square. Do you promise under the penalty of perjury to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. Mr. Garner, please proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'm Jim Garner. I'm State Forester of Virginia, and I'm here today representing the National Association of State Foresters. I served as president of the association in 1995 and have served both as a board member and a chairman of the Association's Fire Protection Committee. And I appreciate the opportunity to discuss the wildfire suppression efforts in the United States. I have attached for the record a report entitled Managing Forest, Managing Fire, a report to the Congress on the status of wildfire management in the United States. This was a cooperative effort of the National Association of State Foresters and the American Forest and Paper Association. The Department of Forestry is the primary agency for wildland fire control in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Like my colleagues in other state forestry agencies, we work closely with local fire departments, state agencies, and federal wildland fire agencies, including USDA Forest Service. We also work through an interstate compact agreement to share resources in times of critical need. And in my view, these relationships are a model of intergovernmental cooperation. There are a few key points worth noting. First, the local fire departments are the first line of defense against wildfire in this nation. Volunteer part departments predominate the rural areas, are, and it's critical that they be well-trained, staffed, and equipped to provide that initial attack on forest fires. The southern region of the United States, as was demonstrated dramatically in Florida, experiences more fire starts than any other part of the nation. An effective network of trained local departments, however, helps keep the cost down by catching these fires when they're small. More importantly, as housing developments encroach into our forest, the jobs of these firefighters become more dangerous, more complicated, and more expensive. The second important feature of our cooperative program is the well-trained and equipped firefighting crews across the country that can be dispatched as needed. This is due to careful coordination by regional coordinating centers, interstate fire compacts, and when necessary through the National Interagency Fire Center, NIPSI we call it, in your own home state of Idaho, Madam Chairman. During the recent fire situation in Florida, every state except two had firefighters' equipment 
or overhead teams in Florida. My department sent four bulldozers, two Hummers, 42 people with all of the support equipment. We were also the leaders of a task force of fire department engine companies that went to Florida. We were assigned in northeast Florida and placed under a unified command under the direction of the Florida Division of Forestry. Thanks to the efforts of the National Wildfire Coordinating Center, NWCG, the state and federal firefighting agencies all train using the same standards and basically on the same equipment. So this allows our resources to use and be familiar with each other when we meet somewhere across this nation. The third part of our effort is the state foresters working closely with USDA Forest Service on several programs that keep this front line of defense active and well prepared. The fire, the state fire assistance program and the volunteer fire assistance program both are managed by the USDA Forest Service Fire and Aviation. And third, the federal excess personal property uh, program which you've heard uh, mentioned pre previously in which we cooperate with the U.S. Forest Service. I think the excess property program is the most innovative of the three. Through a cooperative agreement with the Forest Service provided by the Cooperative Forestry Assistant Act, state foresters are able to screen primarily formerly military equipment at the excess level and not the surplus level. This equipment, which ranges from aircraft to trucks to mobile command centers to clipboards, is reconditioned either by the state or by the local fire departments and put directly in service protecting homes and property from wildfire. Last year in Virginia, we were able to get $116,000 worth of excess property, which we turned over to local fire departments. I think two points of the excess property program are worth bearing in mind. By using the program, we are greatly extending the life of vehicles and other equipment that the taxpayers have already paid for. States and localities add value to this equipment. And there's a tremendous pride in keeping the equipment in service. There is a, on the report that I mentioned earlier on page 15, there is an, a picture, an example of uh, one of those trucks that was used in, by a small community in Virginia. The last point I'd like to make, Madam Chair, is that we will never rid this nation of wildfire. We can, however, take prudent steps through programs that, we've, that I've mentioned to cut costs and save lives and property. We can manage our land to reduce fire dangers. But however, as the events have shown in Florida, sometimes many factors will come together that will nullify the positive impact of prescribed burning and proper forest management. The growth of the wildland urban interface, which in and itself causes numerous complicated factors has turned what would have been straightforward firefighting task into a tremendous exercise of emergency management. And until Mother Nature changed the weather pattern and the only thing that stood between the citizens of Florida and the fire was our national firefighting force. And situations like, forest, like Florida pushed those forces to the limit. We appreciate your support and we look forward to working with you and the rest of the committee uh, to see that these programs are supported. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Garner. Uh, your testimony was very interesting, and I very much appreciate your comments about the eminent concerns that we have over the uh, urban uh, wildland interface. Uh, we do have some legislation be pending before this Congress that uh, has made its way through this committee uh, that would um, help take care of that. So I'd like to work with you personally on that particular legislation. It was suggested by the Forest Service, um, and it deals with a, a new form of management, an overall landscaping uh, management rather than a contract by contract um, management. So I, I think it's very forward looking, and, and I look forward to uh, hearing your, uh, your thoughts about it. Thank you. I do want to say that uh, your comments about, um, about the book put out by a uh, AF and PA are, are good. I, I noticed in here that there was a comment uh, delivered by Interior Secretary Bruce Babbitt in a speech at Boise State University in my state where he, uh, where he stated, by using all the tools we have 
carefully thinning excess young trees, igniting prescribed fires, managing land for fire, controlling evasive and exotic weed species, we must take steps to reduce fuels. And then Jack Ward Thomas also in a hearing in Boise, Idaho on August 29th, 1994, made this statement. I think he really wraps it up. Fires are too hot destructive, dangerous, and too ecologically, economically, aesthetically, and socially damaging to be tolerable. We cannot, in my opinion, simply step back and wait for nature to take its course. Um, I think that's very interesting, plus the comparative pictures that are, that are in this book. Uh, it's very instructive. Thank you very much. Um, Chair recognizes Mr. Schaefer for his comments. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I have a number of questions. You mentioned the importance of interstate agreements and firefighting. How often do you send crews out of state? Uh, normally, we'll have a crew going, at least one crew going somewhere every year uh, out of state. Uh, it's, uh, we got back from Florida, folks had a week's rest, and we turned right around and sent a task force to Texas. Is, that, uh, is Virginia typical of other states in this regard, do you think? Yes, I think so. Uh, we're all available to help each other. Is, where do you typically send your crews? In the past, most have been going to the west, out in the western states. Uh, but uh, we have, uh, two years ago, we sent uh, a large contingency with equipment to Texas when Texas uh, had their problem in 1996. Is the training adequate so that firefighters trained in the uh, southeast, for example, um, are well prepared to fight uh, forest fires in, uh, of different types, say in the Northwest or, or in uh, Southern California? Uh, I don't think training is ever totally adequate. We do the best we can. We try to prepare them to, to fight fire safely and to know what's going on, but uh, I don't believe that, that we're ever adequately trained to where I sleep all night when it's dry. You asked the committee to help ensure that programs for wildland fire management are adequately supported. How are out-of-state operations funded? If they're funded through the, one of the compacts, the receiving state reimburses the sending state for expenses. Uh, does, does a state agency have to pay all of its crew expenses when the crews are sent out of state? Or if your state gets help from out-of-state crews, do you have to uh, cover all of their costs? Yes, sir. All of them? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, do the state federal assistance programs you mentioned help cover these costs? They help. Are they adequately funded? No, sir. No. Well, c can you give us some sense of scale? Well, it, it's relative. Uh, Florida, I, I doubt they've even totaled up the bill yet. And that's uh, on a scale of 10. And to, uh, to other states, it might be a scale of 1. Every case and every summer and, and every spring is going to be different, and I don't have a good answer, except that when it happens to us in Virginia, I doubt I've got enough in my budget to handle it. Hmm. Are, are within-state operations adequately funded? Probably not. Um, do the agencies have sufficient personnel? Probably not. Uh, let me uh, continue on with some other, other questions that I've been uh, waiting to ask you. You mentioned that the uh, challenge of the wildland urban interface <coughs> and how serious an issue that is. Um, you, can you elaborate more on that? How serious of an issue is that in terms of fire preparedness and fire suppression? It's probably, in my opinion, it's probably the most serious thing that's faced us uh, in the wildfire <coughs> arena in my 40 years of work. Because when you, uh, when you place homes and property and lives in the forest, you immediately shift tactics of how you approach the fire. Instead of uh, trying to drop back to what would be a safe fire line, you go immediately to protect homes and people and, and their property. And that puts you in harm's way in a, in a different manner. Therefore, the training that, that I had growing up in the agency is no longer valid because and, and the technology, we, we've got to grasp the technology. Does any one agency bear the primary responsibility for wildland urban interface management? 
generally for the initial response, I should say. Generally, uh, it's the state forestry agencies in the states uh, that are predominant by uh, private land. But that's a cooperative effort with the local fire departments. It, it can't be done by one single group. The federal, the federal policy is consistent with what you just described. Do you think that is an appropriate policy and one that ought to be maintained? I believe so, yes, sir. Are local agencies and fire departments adequ adequately prepared for that challenge? No, sir. Um, and should there be some federal response in, in addressing that level of preparedness that you just described, or, or is this one that ought to be left to the states? I think we need some help. We need help in expertise, new technology, and uh, funding when, uh, when the individual state needs it. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Garner. The uh, questions just asked by Mr. Schaefer are ones, of course, you have probably guessed by now that the chairman is concentrating on. Mm -hmm. And while I still have you on, in, uh, on the witness stand there, I, I wonder if I might ask you to work with your other state foresters in cooperation with this committee to make sure that the Congress can pass legislation that will help focus on that very critical urban wildland interface problem that we have. Uh, will you work with your association of state foresters and with uh, me and, and the other members of this committee and our staff? Yes, ma'am. We, we are that. at your disposal. Do you share with me the fact that time is not on our side, that it is something that we need to deal with uh, probably in, in a manner that uh, will bring us results uh, by next year? Yes, ma'am. Please do. It's very interesting in that in, in my state of Idaho right now, uh, our former uh, United States uh, Secretary of Interior, Cecil Andrus, former Idaho governor, is on television and paid spots by the Bureau of Land Management, urging people to be very, very careful about um, making sure fires are not set carelessly because we have such a high, heavy fuel load uh, because of the cheatgrass that grows that can be grazed uh, in the springtime, but after July it turns very brown and brittle and heavy and creates such hot fires that even two years ago we lost lives fighting just grass fires. So as you can imagine, that's something, that's a concern that I share even with the uh, former uh, Secretary of the Interior, uh, Mr. An Andrus. So I look forward to working with you very closely on this issue. Thank you. Mr. Boyd. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. And <clears throat> Mr. Garner, welcome. Thank you for coming today. I want to take a slightly different direction with my question and first of all I'll tell you that, uh, that our State Forester Earl Peterson was here last week testifying uh, before this uh, committee. And uh, I want to take this opportunity to Thank you personally on behalf of the people of the state of Florida for what you did. Uh, you, you remarked in your previous remarks that you had sent uh, uh, as many firefighters as you could turn loose into Florida. And uh, uh, much of our destroyed uh, uh, property uh, was on private and commercial timberlands and uh, the 126 homes that were destroyed I'm sure we would have had more destroyed if it hadn't been for the efforts of, of the folks from around the country, including those from Virginia that came. And I just want to promise you that if, if the shoe is ever on the other foot, uh, that we will do uh, our part in seeing uh, that we share our resources too. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I wanted to take a direction here that's a little bit different and ask you, uh, I'm sure that uh, Virginia is like most other states in that publicly held forest lands uh, come under, uh, I mean, there's a great deal of pressure to change the, the civil cultural practices, harvest, harvesting practices that, that have been traditional that we've done in the past once they come into to, uh, public ownership. What management tools or civil cultural <coughs> practices are you uh, using in the Commonwealth of Virginia to, uh, to keep your forest healthy and to, uh, to keep and fire suppression down. Are you referring to forest management practices? Exactly. Uh, thinning, we're, we're heavily promoting thinning. 
particularly as it relates to areas around the interface. By reducing the number of stems, you have reduced the opportunity of fire to travel from treetop to treetop. In fact, we have an active program going now with developers that we try to thin. Uh, the prescribed burning program, we need to promote that and to enhance it and encourage it more. Uh, the National Forest in Virginia has started last year. They're, they've really gone big gun on, on this. I, I'm, prefer, uh, I'm referring mostly to uh, timber, uh, to uh, forest land that is in your jurisdiction, state forest. State forest. And what you do in your state forest. And thinning and uh, mostly thinning uh, because part of our state forest is in uh, the hardwood, on the hardwood sites. And so therefore we have to be very judicious how we prescribe burning in hardwoods. Any of our pine stands, we have started an active prescribed burning program, uh, thinning and uh, burning the understory. We're not quite as flat nor as pine oriented as your state, Mr. Boyd. So therefore we, we deal mostly with smaller acreages, even on our state forest. But we are actively trying to get our prescribed burning program up and running on our state forest. Okay, uh, so and you, you have an active thinning program in place that yes, you sir. think uh, is a very important part of your management, uh, a very important management tool in terms Ab of keeping your, your forest lands healthy. Absolutely. Um, Mr. Garner, we heard testimony here last week from one of our witnesses that, uh, tr and she tried to make the case that thinning particularly thinning and even prescribed burning, uh, was not uh, uh, a practice that would uh, assist in management of, uh, of, of the possibility of fire. In other words, it didn't necessarily uh, cause a situation that would, you would have, where you would have less fires. Uh, would you care to comment on that from your perspective as a, a lifelong forester, I assume? You, you're certainly not in a position that you are in without having some scientific expertise uh, in terms of, of, of forest management. If I understand your, your question, was will thinning and active management connected with prescribed burning reduce fire? Yes. That's uh, it. it will reduce certainly the impact of the fire, it will reduce the severity of the fire, and it gives you a fighting chance uh, of stopping the fire when it's unwanted. Okay. Uh, I, can't, I can't imagine why it wouldn't work. Okay. That, that was sort of my reaction, too. I wanted to make sure I got the expert's reaction. Uh, we, one of the things that we recognized in the fires in Florida was that uh, uh, in those areas where we had not prescribed burned, and these were either on, these were on private lands and or state lands, we had not prescribed burned because of public pressure uh, around highways and around developments. Uh, you, you're you should, nodding and smiling. You're familiar with that kind of situation. And uh, we immediately recognized when we got in this terrible drought situation uh, and the fires broke out that uh, the worst worst fires when those areas where we had not prescribed burn and actually uh, obviously since they were in the areas that were highly populated that's where we lost our homes uh, what are you doing in Virginia to uh, to overcome that kind of, or deal with that situation and that public pressure that comes not to prescribe burn not much more than your state forester unfortunately <laughs> Because the public reaction to the smoke, to the, to the fear of fire, the, the lack of understanding of prescribed burning is, is out there. And I think the biggest thing we can do is have support of members from your committee to, to let you certainly have more visibility than, than a state forester to say it's okay and it's a necessary thing for the forest health and it's a necessary thing for the protection of their own property. And that we as professionals can and do know how to manage the smoke. Well, uh, I, I hope that we, we will do some uh, a follow-up uh, and, and bring some data, some statistics from our own experience that will be helpful to, to states all around the country, Madam Chairman, and, and uh, I appreciate your 
answers. I have one more question, if you might indulge me. Please question. proceed. Uh, you have national forest in the state of Virginia? Yes, sir, one. One, okay. Do you think uh, giving increased flexibility to either the local or the state forester who is in charge of that national forest is helpful in terms of uh, management or reacting to these kinds of situations like we had in Florida? Of course, that's a, a f the, an administrative decision of another agency, but I am one who believes in, in pushing decision making right down to the lowest possible level, and because that's where you solve problems. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much, Mr. Garner. That, uh, one of the things that, that we learned uh, from our fires in Florida on our national forest lands was that uh, once the fire started and the local on the ground forester had no authority to make decisions relative to how to deal with that, once it went up the chain uh, to where it had to go and came back, uh, 24 to 48 hours had passed and obviously we had we had fires that were burning uh, upwards of four and 5,000 acres a day once they started. So that was the, the point that I wanted uh, to make, and uh, you, you've answered it uh, very succinctly, I think, in terms of the lowest, push the decision-making level down as low as you can, practically do is, is, the, is the proper way to respond. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman and Mr. Garner. Thank you, Mr. Boyd. The chair recognizes Mr. Peterson from Pennsylvania. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gardner. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, welcome, Mr. Gardner, from Virginia. I'm, I'm from Pennsylvania, just to the north of you, and I'm sure you've worked with Jim Grace, our forester, uh, been a personal friend of mine for many years, and his predecessors also, uh, representing... Uh, I come from the finest hardwood forest in America, northern tier Pennsylvania, where oak and cherry doesn't get any better than that, and I don't find many people who are willing to argue with me about that. Uh, what do you think of the Forest Service recently stepped up prescribed burn fire burn program on the hardwood forest, especially where they're trying to favor oak and hickory stands? I think it's a great thing. You think it's a... Yes, sir. Okay. You think it's working well? Well, they're just getting started in our state, but uh, mm -hmm. I think it's it's needed. And if we want to maintain the uh, species composition and the, and the diversity of the complex, I think it had to be. Okay. When I was growing up, uh, I was... Uh, one, where I come from, they're not really mountains, but they're hills. <laughs> and I was one hill away from a, a stream where there was a railroad track, and every year there was a prescribed burn where the steam-run locomotives that were fired with coal would spew out sparks. And, and every, if we had a dry spring, uh, we had smoke uh, all spring, or for a week or two was until those fires would get put out. But they'd, and, and it's one of the finest oak forests uh, in our region uh, from that. Uh, I guess I'm interested in how do you work with volunteer fire companies? I come from <clears throat> the most rural part of Pennsylvania, the most rural district east of the Mississippi, and uh, volunteer fire departments uh, are a vital part of firefighting in our forested area. Uh, do you have uh, some plan of working with your volunteers? Yes, sir. Uh, as I noted in my remarks, in our opinion, and I think this would be true of all the state foresters in the South, uh, the local volunteer fire departments are a front line of defense. They're the first out. They keep the acreage small. Uh, they're out there uh, day and night. And uh, I, we could, I would be afraid to go back to Virginia without them. Do you, uh, do you fund them in any way on, for helping with state land? Do you somehow help them with state resources? The, the biggest help that we in Virginia give them is the excess property, uh, trucks, uh, hoses, equipment, okay. that's uh, got to be one of the most beneficial programs that I think <coughs> the relationship between federal government and state government is. Uh, we have a small grant program administered uh, by the U.S. Forest Service through the states. Uh, it's a small one, but uh, you can take a rural company and give them a few dollars and it's amazing. You, you've seen that what they can do. Well, uh, I'm going to be meeting in the next few weeks because uh, the Allegheny National Forest, which is 550,000 acres, is in my district. And, 20 fire departments are asking to meet with me that uh, that are a part of the forest and who fight fires there and um, they have never been able to use the resources from the timber cuts you know the 25 percent that goes back that's not allowable use in there would you support the language change at the federal level that that 
part of that money could go back to those fire departments to help them? Well, I, I come back to the way I answered Mr. Boyd's question that push the decision to the lowest also. possible level and let the localities decide. Well, I think but they at also least give, at least give the opportunity for those localities to have the flexibility. Yeah, the, the, it would still be up to the local yeah. governments, but it would be an allowable use if they wanted to, in some yes. way, buy equipment or provide training. Because I, you know, volunteer firefighters are, are, are a breed of their own. I mean, they they give their lives. Uh, they love every minute of it. It's it's almost a religion with them. And uh, if you teach them, you know, it's, it, fighting structure fires is altogether different than fighting forest fires. And, and I wonder if we concentrate enough on really teaching them how to fight forest fires or giving them tools. No, we don't. No, we don't. But, but see, they're a resource that's not on the payroll 30 or, or 52 week a <laughs> year. You know, they're not a big cost. Uh, a little bit of money it buys you an awful lot in volunteer fire departments. Uh, would it? You would recommend that we here in Washington look at somehow making sure that at the bottom uh, where, where the fires are in the districts uh, that, that the volunteers are more integral part and receive the training they need and maybe even the equipment they need? Yes, sir. There's, there's part of the uh, Forest Service budget that has a line of it, the volunteer fire assistance program that I think uh, needs your support, frankly. Okay. That, you would suggest expanding that? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, how do you determine uh, what funds you need, staffing levels and equipment, for a given year? Hmm. Uh, I guess a lot of it is determined by our, our fire history and the acres that, that in Virginia I am responsible to protect. But the new factor has been now how many homes are in those acres that were not there years ago. And so you, you look at history and uh, you know your resources, you know the availability of other outside f fire resources. It's, uh, it, it's an art, not a science, as to how you determine how well prepared are we. Then take what we have and focus a lot on training, focus a lot on uh, outside resources, outside of government, forest products industry, volunteer fire departments, uh, schools and universities, any, any warm body you can find, and then train them and equip them. One of the most concerning things I have is giving them personal equipment, personal protective equipment. I, I need, I think we all need to address that. Uh, we had 50 senators in Pennsylvania and 203 House members, and we had about six people probably that gave a damn what was in the forestry budget, that even looked at it, uh, that, that, uh, wouldn't scream if that would scream if there were cuts or kept flat funded for a decade. Do you find that true in your state too? That there's only a few that uh, urban America loves the forest. They love to travel in them, hike in them, but they don't want to spend any money on making sure that they're whole. Well, maybe I wouldn't go quite as far as you went, but I think that there are only a few in in the legislature who who looks at and understands and appreciate the the forestry package. Uh, in any budget. Thank you very much. Mr. Garner, I want to conclude with just a couple of questions in follow-up to the line of questioning that Mr. Boyd began. And I would uh, also yield to him after I've finished these two questions for, uh, for any additions that he may wish to make involving his own state of Florida. So I'm asking you, as the state forester in Virginia, to take a situation that I have been informed about that occurred in Florida and as a state forester speak, not only just for Virginia, but for uh, the association or for other state foresters who have been highly trained in terms of not only firefighting, but state forestry and uh, silvicultural science. Mr. Garner, I have been informed that in Florida, there were um, two fires that occurred almost simultaneously. Both occurred on opposite of each other on uh, across from one another on a road. On one side of the road, there was a um, an area that had more access, and it could be accessed by multiple agencies. And so they lost a total of 18 acres in this area. On the other side of the road, it was a wilderness area, and c fire could only be fought by 
the Federal Forest Service. So we had a turf question here. And while on one side of the road they lost 18 acres, on the other side of the road, in a, in a wilderness area where tourists like to come and view the wilderness, we had allowed a situation to develop where the result was that 20,000 acres burned. So we look at the difference between 18 acres in an area that was more easily accessible and probably by more than one agency. On the other side, it wasn't accessible and only one agency can handle it. My question is this, given that scenario, and that's tragic, I think anyone would have to admit that's tragic, and even though Florida's vegetation recovers um, more quickly than the east slope of the, of the uh, Cascades and on into the Rockies, because we're drier out there, nevertheless, it still takes its toll. For several years, the landscapes will never look the same. And um, so given that, scenario, wouldn't it be better if there could, ahead of time, be developed a cooperative agreement so that the, those agencies, whether it's the state or local agencies, are able to access any fire in, within the borders of the state to try to suppress it and contain it before it, it, it develops into such a huge fire that it's very destructive? Um, is that an area that we in the Congress should be looking at? Um, more agency cooperation between the state and the Federal Forest Service so that if, as, as a state forester who has command and control of, of, of fire suppression over your own state lands, if you could also be given uh, the ability to, under some sort of contract, be able to contain fires on federal land, um, would you look favorably at that? Or what would your thinking be, Mr. Garner? I, uh, I would look favorably at that as one state forester. And I would suspect that many of my colleagues would, would also. The wildernesses of east, east of the Mississippi are a lot different than the wilderness in, in your area because they're smaller, they are uh, more fragmented, and there is a tremendous, normally a tremendous population around those smaller wildernesses. And so therefore, whether it be insect disease, fire, whatever, the impact of eastern wilderness spill over into, uh, into the private arena. Uh, and that can be threatening, uh, as we've seen with uh, both fire and insect disease. The lack of flexibility, the lack of the agencies to be able to, to deal with whatever is going on in that particular wilderness is really hamstringing all of us who are interested in natural resources, and I, I use that in its broadest context. Forest health, uh, for whatever endangered species. It could be that in the case that you outlined, uh, simply because the fire could not be contained, we may have lost an endangered species that that land had been set aside to protect. And, and so policy issues sometimes need to rest with the man on the ground or the woman on the ground, that, with the experts. And what fits West Coast doesn't fit East Coast in all cases when we're dealing with natural resources. And, and I, think, I think there's a real danger there. And I, I do want to yield to, uh, to Mr. Boyd, but I do want to say that in every case, whether it's the East Coast or the West Coast, the destruction of endangered species habitat is very sad uh, when we're not able to contain fire or prepare ahead of time by removing unnecessary fuel load, that to see it destroy not only the habitat but the species itself. Um, and another thing that you touched on, and I do want to elaborate, is the fact that in Florida and, and in the eastern states, your wilderness designations are more fragmented, and they do abut up to multiple use and sometimes urban interfaces. So, um, you know, in order to protect private property and human lives, as well as protect endangered species and their habitat, I do think we need to 
be a little more forward-looking in terms of of uh, looking ahead to prevent these very, very hot fires. And I do want to say that prescribed burning under the proper conditions are very important. And um, but it, I believe that it has to be the proper conditions. Yes, ma'am. So with that, I, I will yield uh, for a couple more minutes to Mr. Boyd if he has any final questions. Well, I think you've. Uh, You've asked the pertinent question, Madam Chairman, but let me just say uh, to Mr. Garner and, and also to the uh, next panel, because I think that uh, we, we would want to ask them some questions about this particular issue so they may prepare. Um, the scenario that you just described, uh, Madam Chairman, happened in the Apalachicola National Forest in Walcala County, Florida, which is in the second congressional district. And uh, we believe that the uh, fires uh, which were both started adjacent to a highway running through the National Forest, were, were started by an arsonist. And uh, the fire actually on the, the uh, non-wilderness side we put out uh, after it burned 15 acres. The fire on the wilderness side, according to the numbers that I have in front of me, which is from the state of Florida, burned uh, 24,600 acres. Uh, we, again, we believe that since they were both started on the highway simultaneously in the same area, uh, that it was arsonist. Uh, we don't have solid proof of that, though. But uh, I want to thank thank you, Mr. Garner, for your for your fine presentation. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Garner, I was going to let you go. I just have one final question that I need to ask you while you're here. How do you, as a professional manager, uh, manage the uh, smoke when you prescribe? Uh, burn on your on your state lands. Uh, let me kind of qualify that first. In Virginia, we have very few acres of state lands. Uh, per Seventy-seven percent of the forest land in Virginia is owned by private individuals, such as yourself. And so we do a lot of burning for the private landowner. But our, our smoke management is something that's becoming very critical, and it's all formulated in weather conditions as well as the, the fuels of the floor, depending on the objective you want to accomplish. If you're doing an understory burn for a reduction or, or habitat, you don't need the intensity of fire that you do if you're doing after a logging job when you're trying to clean up the slash to reforest. So you have to know your objective. You have to know the mixing height. Uh, you've got to know your whole spectrum of, um, of atmospheric changes that are going on. Is the smoke going to go up and dissipate? Is it going to lay down and dissipate? Be careful that you don't burn uh, in the fall of the year because at nights you get an inversion and you wind up with a lot of smoke on the road, which is very dangerous. You have, you all start with the weatherman is what we do. We start with the weatherman who predicts and as best they can what the weather conditions are going to be and knowing what that smoke will do under that given set of weather conditions is critical in managing not only the smoke but the fire as well. And so we just don't go out and, and light a match and uh, turn around and pick up a cup of coffee and, and sit there and watch it burn. It, it is a scientific process. Mr. Peterson. One quick question. Uh, Mr. Garner, if, if groups like the Sierra Club in uh, Heartland, Heartwood win the argument that they're making of zero cut on public land, what will happen to our public forests? I think that uh, they will sit there and be used by a few uh, for their own benefit and that uh, a lot of stewardship of natural resources will go to waste. I think that as a second part of that, uh, our, our products that we demand from the forest have got to come from somewhere and do we as a nation with the scientific and professional uh, know-how and the climate to have productive forest, do we say we lock up ours and then we go to some undeveloped third world country that can ill afford uh, an ecological disaster because they don't have the resources? I is that right that we, that we lock up <coughs> a resource that we know how to manage and know how to care for? And, and push that. We're not going to change our need for, for forest products. 
uh, I don't think, in this country. And uh, as long as the demand is there, the wood's got to come from somewhere. And, and I think that this nation has the scientific and professional ability to nurture all of our natural resources uh, without putting a, an ecological disaster on some other nation. Well, coming from the East, the same as you, I thank you for your comments, but uh, we deal with more hardwoods than we do softwoods, but that varies up and down the coast of this country, but uh, it, 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 it's a product that we can be producing. Uh, you know, good hunting is where you've timbered. Uh, many of the outdoor sports uh, deal with the land that's been, where some timber's been marketed or where some thinning's been done. Many species, it was interesting to watch in our area, we had the tornadoes in 85, and what, which took down mile-wide paths of hardwood forest of you know, mature oak and cherry trees, just, just twisted them apart and laid them on the ground. And the thick forest that has grown there and the wildlife species that are being seen there that we didn't see a lot of before because it's the kind of habitat that they need. I mean, we're, we're, it's been very interesting to watch that forest grow, which is probably 20, 30 feet high already today, uh, a decade later, uh, and what species are there, not only of, of timber, but what species are there of all the wildlife and the creatures that use that as their home. It's a whole different, it, it's been interesting to watch. And all of that, uh, but, but there's, I, wanna, I guess the part that the point I want to make is we have a very strong argument going on in this country, and I'm not sure we're winning it by groups who want zero cut on public land. And I, I thank you for your testimony on that. Mr. Garner, thank you very much for your very instructive and informative testimony. Um, thank you for having me. I thank you for, uh, f for this information that is a permanent part of our record. And I do want to let you know that our record uh, here will remain open for 10 working days. And uh, should you wish to add anything to your testimony, uh, my staff would be happy to, to work with you on that. So with that, again, I want to thank you very much for your valuable time here. And uh, I'll now call the third panel. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And as they're taking the witness table, I, I want to say that our third panel will be comprised of Wally Jeppesen, the Wildland Fire Specialist in the Office of Managing Risk and Public Safety, U.S. Department of Interior, Janice McDougall, Associate Deputy Chief uh, for State and Private Forestry, Forest Service, U.S. Department of Agriculture, and Ms. McDougall is accompanied by Denny Truesdale, um, assistant Director on uh, Fire Management for Operations uh, in the Forest Service, U.S. Department of Agriculture. Now, as you know, you're all, um, you've all been here many times before, and so I will administer the oath now. If you raise your hand to the square, do you promise and affirm under the penalty of perjury that you will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Thank you. We, uh, we open our testimony with uh, Mr. Jepson. Madam Chairman and members of the committee, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the Department of Interior's planning and budgeting processes for the Wildland Fire Management Program. The Bureau of Land Management, the National Park Service, the Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Bureau of Indian Affairs are the four land management agencies within the Department of Interior with fire management programs. These agencies work in close cooperation on budgeting, planning, and implementation activities related to fire management. The department's wildland fire management program is guided by the principles and policies of the federal wildland fire management policy and program review adopted by the secretaries of agriculture and interior in December of 1995. The program ensures the capability to provide a safe and cost-effective fire management organization. Fires are suppressed at minimum cost considering firefighter and public safety and benefits and values to be protected consistent with resource objectives. Funds for the department's wildland fire management program are appropriated to the Bureau of Land Management and are made available by allocation to the National Park Service Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Bureau of Indian Affairs. The department's wildland fire management program is composed of two activities, wildland fire preparedness and wildland fire operations.
Fire preparedness involves the readiness and capability of the department to suppress fires in a safe and cost-effective program. Staffing levels, training, fire planning, equipment, maintenance facilities, prevention activities, and interagency coordination all fall within the category of fire preparedness. The fire management plan is the guide for budgeting and managing the wildland fire preparedness activity. The primary analysis tool is the fire plan is an economic marginal cost analysis combined with a threshold analysis which is used to determine the most efficient level, which we call MIL. MIL represents the funding necessary to provide the most cost efficient and technically effective fire management program that meets land management objectives while minimizing the total cost of both suppression and resource damage associated with wildland fire. The fire operations portion of the program funds the development and implementation of the emergency suppression, emergency rehabilitation, hazardous fuel reduction operations, and fire severity programs. Emergency suppression includes all management actions taken to suppress wildland fires in a safe and cost-effective manner. Emergency rehabilitation is carried out to prevent any further land degradation and resource damage to lands impacted by unplanned wildland fire or suppression activities. Rehabilitation funds are also used to reduce any residual public health and safety risks that may result from wildland fires. Hazardous fuel reduction operations use fire and mechanical treatments as management tools to reduce fuel loadings and restore fire to its natural role in the ecosystem. Commercial activities such as timber harvest and small wood product sales are used whenever commodity productions can be used in an environmentally sound manner to achieve the same objectives. Wildland fires occur unexpectedly and create an emergency in which firefighters must respond rapidly to minimize risk and damage. Despite public expectations, when the combination of excessive fuel buildup, steep topography, extreme weather conditions, multiple ignitions, and extreme fire behavior, it is impossible to immediately suppress all fires. Firefighter and public safety must best be met with the adequate preparation, interagency coordination of personnel, supplies, and services, and safe but aggressive implementation of fire control tactics provide for our ability to suppress fires. To meet these needs, the BLM, in cooperation with other DOI bureaus, the Forest Service, and the National Weather Service, maintains and operates the National Interagency Fire Center at Boise, Idaho. NIFSI provides logistical support through its coordination center for the coordinated movement of suppression resources when local capabilities are exceeded. Response to requests are based upon the concepts of closest forces and total mobility, which seek to dispatch the closest available qualified resource regardless of agency affiliation. We are asked by the committee to identify both jobs well done and lessons learned as a result of the wildfires in Florida. While review of the past actions may lead to improvements, Florida fires did not indicate a major need to revamp our procedures. The Department of Interior and the Coordination Center for the most part serve primarily as a support function. Most of the Florida fires, including most high profile and highly publicized fires were under the control of the state. Madam Chairman, I'd like to thank Congress for the direction and support that you have provided us in the Department of Interior. This concludes my statement. Thank you, Mr. Josephson. Um, very interesting. And now the Chair recognizes Janice McDougall. Thank you, Madam Chairman and members of the committee. I'm Janice McDougall, Associate Deputy Chief for State and Private Forestry with responsibility for fire and aviation, forest health, and cooperative forestry programs. I'm accompanied today by Denny Truesdale, who's our Assistant Director for Fire and Aviation Management for Operations. 
I'd like to, Madam Chairman, submit my formal testimony for the record and briefly summarize my remarks. The wildfire suppression program in the United States is in partnership with a broad array of federal agencies, state, tribal, and local governments, and private companies. Its first priority is in protecting human life. When a fire occurs, we respond immediately. We implement attack strategies, we identify additional resources needed, and we expand the organization as needed to protect people and property. Several factors influence an effective and safe fire suppression program, including expansive wildland urban interface, hazardous fuels conditions, the increasingly broad array of partners involved in suppression, and the increased role for the Forest Service in providing international assistance. We have an outstanding track record. The federal firefighting agencies have consistently suppressed 98% of all wildfires during initial attack. Only 2% of all fires account for the greatest cost and the most acreage burn. The five federal wildland fire management agencies, the Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management, Fish and Wildlife Service, National Park Service, and Bureau of Indian Affairs are strengthening the common features of their respective wildland fire management planning processes. Initial attack analysis and planning is the backbone of our success. The National Fire Management Analysis System is a model we use to identify the most efficient firefighting organization. Developed locally to determine what mix and distribution of initial attack resources will provide a cost-effective fire suppression program, the results of the local analysis are aggregated into the national program. This assures the most responsive organization possible. When initial attack fails and local resources are not capable of controlling one or more, such as incident management teams and interagency hotshot crews and large air tankers, the 1998 in 1998, the federal agencies are fully staffed for the fire season. We have adequate resources in every region for effective suppression, assuming that this ill is and will be an average year. The Florida effort affirmed the value of a prescribed fire program to create more fire-tolerant ecosystems and better protect homes and improvements. It also reinforced the value of our safety program. In Florida, we even had to educate crews from other regions of the health and fire threats unique to Florida. The Forest Service's fire suppression program is professional, is responsive to the concerns and needs of partners, and is based on the continuous study of historical fire occurrences, and risk. We are very proud of this program, its value to the public, and the firefighters who work endless days and get great satisfaction from the protection of people and resources. Madam Chairman, this concludes my remarks, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. McDougall. And the Chair recognizes Mr. Schaefer, the gentleman from Colorado. Ms. McDougall, when it comes to the controlled burns that have been initiated by the Department of the Interior and the Forest Service as well. Uh, what kind of resources do you find that uh, you need to devote to uh, helping, assisting, managing these controlled burns? Is, is there any... You're talking about a fuels program? Is, is that what you're talking about? What do you mean the fuels program? That... Our, our fuels reduction program. Right. Well, it, I'm not speaking of the program in its totality, but on those occasions when we increase, for example, this year we increased rather dramatically to, to the extent of about 400 percent, I understand, the, 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 the amount of public lands 
that is slated for controlled burns. Now, when we do that, I assume that there's some kind of prevention, suppression personnel that is needed to help contain and maintain and, and make sure that those burns are controlled. Uh, I, I guess my question is to what, it, how, how, how much in the way of personnel do we consume in managing controlled burns? Acres are identified by our field personnel. We don't do that out of the Washington office. Um, we estimate that in FY99, we will treat about 1.4 million acres out there nationally, just within the Forest Service. But fuels treatment is an interagency priority, and other land management agencies will do that as well. Uh, by the year 2005, we estimate that we'll be burning up to about 3 million acres a year, or treating 3 million acres a year. And that's probably as much as we can do with smoke considerations. Let me ask you, in, in Colorado, for example, there are stakeholders who are constantly negotiating over how many acres might be subject to active management. Uh, to your knowledge, have administrative appeals of forest plans or uh, timber sales prevented action necessary to mitigate or prevent uh, dangerous fires? I'm not clear what you're asking me here. Can, can appe appeals apply to all our ground disturbing activities? I mean, we, we, that's just part of the process. There, but beyond a, that, I'm not sure. There's proposals to, uh, to expand, for example, the acreage that would be under a managed category. Um, as long as there are admin of administrative appeals pending, uh, I presume that there's not much in the way of management that takes place on, on those occasions. Is, it, is, it, is this as a result of the policies of, of the departments that, that, uh, um, that were unable to, um, <coughs> excuse me, is, is it because of the, the department's policies that were unable to go ahead and begin managing these lands for fire prevention for, in, in ways that might um, I can't speak to specific uh, activities in Colorado, but my overall answer is no. I'm sorry, the last part of your answer? My overall answer is no. Uh, you don't believe there's any? I, I, I really would, would prefer to speak to specifics, but I'm not sure what you're talking about here. Uh, you, you're not sure about the impact of the ad administrative appeals process is on the ability to begin managing land either, either uh, privately through thinning, through... We've been through living with the administrative appeals process for many years, so I'm, I'm, I'm struggling here. Do you believe it has any delay at all on, on our ability to, to engage active management plans that might be useful in suppressing or preventing wildfires? I can't... I, I, the process itself is not new. Maybe the number of appeals you're getting out there may have changed, but the process we've lived with, we factor it into our day-to-day -day activities, and it's, it's uh, applied much broader than, than what you are talking about here. So you don't believe the length of time that these appeals uh, take to be resolved has any impact on, on Depends uh, fire Depends on how suppression. many you get. You know, some you get few, some you get none, some you get lots, and it just, it varies from uh, decision to decision. What steps are we taking to better predict where forest fires are likely to occur? We have um, tentatively estimated that um, there are about 40 million acres that are at high risk from um, uh, fires, uh, big fires. We will have those numbers refined later on this fall and have a clearer idea of, of where they are. We also already have um, a map, a national map, that lays out across ownership um, those areas that are at high risk for um, mortality from insect and disease. And once we're able to merge that information, it will help us tremendously in determining our priorities. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chair recognizes Mr. Boyd. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairman and uh, Ms. McDougall. I want to express uh, my appreciation to the folks that work for you all the way down to the last firefighter. 
certainly we don't have any quarrel with them. They did an outstanding job. Uh, I know that's under your leadership, and we are very grateful for that. For that. We're not always uh, pleased with the uh, policy uh, sometimes, and uh, that's maybe probably primarily what I want to discuss today. Uh, I'm not mean or bad or anything, and I want you to, uh, to know that, but I do have some very serious questions about, uh, about the policy. Uh, first of all, I want to kind of lay out the situation we have in North Florida. And I, one of the reasons that, uh, that I ask uh, Chairman Chenoweth and, and she agreed to let me come sit is because the two national forests that we have in, state Flor in the state of Florida, uh, or we have three national forests, as you know. Two of them are in the second congressional district, which I uh, represent, the Apalachicola National Forest, and, over on the uh, west side, southwest of Tallahassee, and then the Osceola National Forest, mm -hmm. which is between Tallahassee and uh, Jacksonville and Gainesville. Uh, the Apalachicola National Forest is, is, uh, is one really I want to spend most of my time on today. It's a very special place. You may or may not know that it contains, uh, I forget the exact acreage, 100. 500, yeah, almost 600,000 acres, 2,550 and 600,000 acres. It was uh, actually a piece of land that was clear cut back in the early 1900s. Uh, in those days that we were doing some very silly things in terms of our natural resources. Uh, but through uh, a very sensible management program over the last uh, 70 or 80 years, we managed to, to bring, rehabilitate that and bring it back to a uh, very vibrant, uh, alive forest that today house, houses the, large, the world's largest uh, red cockaded wood, woodpecker population. And we're, we're very proud of that. Um, there have been, uh, for your information, there has been a lot of controversy uh, in North Florida about forest management practices there, primarily uh, well, basically how we manage it and, and, and how we uh, have cut the timber. There, as you may know, there has been a, a restriction of timber cutting in the last few years. It's almost come down to nothing. Uh, even though the fact the plan that we'd been on for the last 70 or 80 years had gotten us to, uh, to, to a, a, a very good point in terms of wildlife habitat and a, and a natural setting that uh, we were very proud of, we suddenly, want, in the last uh, 10, 15 years, want to change that. And uh, it's created some real problems in some of the communities I represent, primarily uh, with the local governments in terms of the, the Avalorum tax revenue that uh, they had been uh, receiving. As you know, we put in place two programs uh, to offset those Avalorum uh, tax issues for the local communities. One was the PILT, Payment in Lieu of Taxes program, which still exists, and the other was a 25 percent program. But most of the folks, if you talk to them about the 25 percent uh, program, they will kind of laugh at you because they say, well, the federal government really pulled one on us. They said, we're going to give you 25 percent of everything we cut, uh, but then they, then they reduced the cutting to, to practically nothing. And we have school systems. I have, one, in particular, one school system that is in pretty deep trouble financially because, because of the loss of those, uh, those funds. So I give you that as kind of a background uh, to let you know where I'm, I'm coming from. Uh, I've spent all of my professional life uh, in agriculture. Uh, part of that was uh, forestry management. Uh, I, uh, I managed for three specific purposes. One was aesthetic value, economic production, and, why, and thirdly, wildlife habitat. I believe that they're not incompatible. I believe those three are compatible. And I, for the life of me, it, I, I struggle in, in understanding this great debate that we have going on about uh, between the extreme environmental community and the extreme economic community, if you, if you understand what I mean. Yes, and I, I do. I, I think that we just need a little more common sense in this and we'll get along. Now I'm going to get to the questions. Thank you, Madam Chairman, for indulging me on that. I wanted everybody to understand the lay of the land. Uh, this, the situation that was described earlier about the uh, two fires that started on, on the highway, uh, 
what is your reaction to that? And uh, first, if you will, just give me your reaction, then let me ask you some specific questions. My understanding of that situation was that it was um, not, it was not described to me as a wilderness issue. It was described to me as swamp burning and the inability to get equipment, heavy equipment in the area. And it was also a safety issue. And that's why the decision was made to let it go. Ms. McDougall, if it wasn't described to you as a wilderness issue, somebody inaccurately described it. Because it was clearly on one side of the road was wilderness, and we can do look at the maps afterwards, and the other side was not. And uh, because of the inability of the person on the ground to understand what authority they had or didn't have, uh, then we had a situation that burned about 24,000 acres. And actually, at the end of that, was, was beginning to threaten uh, some populated areas on the west side. Uh, so that really leads me to the issue about the authority that people have on the ground. And uh, I've had this discussion with Ms. Marcia Carney, who is your new state forester. I spent some time with her last weekend, two weeks ago, uh, reviewing or, or observing or seeing, looking at the, the burned areas. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that I'd like to see come out of this is more flexibility for the people on the ground who need to make decisions quickly. Because it has to come to your office. It takes 24 to 48 hours. Uh, you know, you, you've got something that's totally out of control by then. 48 hours, those fires had burned 10,000 acres. So uh, give me your reaction to more flexibility on the ground. When your, things, your when things, and Denny can speak to the incident command thing, but when things come to us, we send them back. We don't try to second guess decisions out there. We can't. And we entrust our incident commanders with the responsibility and authority to do the right thing. And uh, so, yes, people do come to us. We do get calls, but we send them to the field. Madam Chairman, if you'll indulge me for one more question, and I'm going to, uh, then I'm going to quit for the time being. Um, what, under what circumstances uh, are the wilderness rules, could, could we have gone in and stopped that fire with, uh, w with all resources that we had available uh, at, at when we first discovered it? Are there, are there uh, within the law, uh, provisions which allow us to waive those rules? For big fire, sure. Who would have to make that waiver? Okay. Uh, I'm not sure, but we believe the regional foresters have the authority to make that call. Again, we don't. Okay, that's not what the regional foresters are telling me, and that's something that maybe that we could work together on, okay. is to clarify that authority. And uh, you know, my point is that, that, that there ought to be clear rules about when we can use that waiver. And we ought to give that authority either to the, to the local forester in charge of that forest or the state, your state forester, who can be there in a matter of hours uh, under any circumstances. So, uh, Maybe that's something that we can work together on, and okay. because it definitely, in this case, we burned about 24,000 acres that probably could have been prevented. Madam Chairman, I, uh, I'll defer any other questions until to later on if we have more time. All right, Mr. Boyd, Mr. Peterson. Uh, Mr. Josephson, we heard uh, from the Forest Service that they estimate about 40 million acres of their land are at risk for catastrophic fires. Uh, what would be the figure on um, the land that you manage? I don't have a figure at this time, but I could provide one for the future. We you are. Don't, that's not a figure that you hear talked about, or, or no, you think sir. there is one? There is a process for developing one, or? Yes, we are in the process of, of coming up with a figure. Do you think it's sizable, like the Forest Service? I'm, su I'm sure it's significant in, in acreage, yes. Is there a... Um, plan being developed to, uh, to shrink it? I mean, you know, it seems like 40 million acres, one agency that's at 
risk for catastrophic fires. I mean, that's a destructive fire. Uh, yes, we are trying to uh, set in place a program to manage the fuels and reduce the fuel loading. But uh, as has been discussed here, you know, there's been some policy sh shifts in the last few years that some feel make it really impossible to manage the fuel load. I mean, you can't remove fuel without cutting it or doing something with it. I mean, if, 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 we, if we were moving towards a zero-cut policy, and there's certainly been a lot of evidence of that, uh, how do you manage the fuel load if, you've, you know, if, if above you decisions are being made that we're, we're not going to cut trees? I think you have to look at each situation and develop a plan to, to manage that particular piece of ground and that has to be done at the local level. But, but we've already found out that local people are not making those decisions, are not allowed to make those decisions. At least for the Department of Interior, the uh, local manager is the one who develops the, the fuel management program and the plans to uh, modify the fuels on the ground. And then he has to get approval from Washington. No, it's generally the next level higher, which signs off on the approval. Regional? Um, re depending on the agency, whether it's regional or state level. If I could switch to uh, Ms. McDougall. Uh, I don't mean this to sound harsh because it's not personal, but, but there are those who give your agency and your organization just A pluses on fighting fires, responding to the crisis moving fast, working hard, being coordinating, but they give very bad grades on the efforts to minimize fires. Do you find policies that you have no control over prevent you from really doing that job? I'm not sure I understand what you're, you're saying. What do you mean efforts to minimize fires? Well, you, you admit you have 40 million acres at risk yes. of catastrophic fires. Yes. There are many who feel the Forest Service is failing at carrying out the role to lower that number and to pre prevent these catastrophic fires by doing what is necessary. Well, I think that our, our acres uh, targeted for reduction and our budgets reflect just the opposite. And Congress has been very supportive in supporting our budget increases to do that. And we are. Yes, we are meeting the targets that we've identified. Well, that may be more current, but I'm speaking of historic in the last few years. That <coughs> are you, are you, uh, you've had an increase in the last year or two, haven't you? On, in yes. Yes. So, you, so you're shifting policy here again. You're coming back to the burn policy. And well, I think we know more about fire ecology now than we used to. And that's not unique to the Forest Service. That's true of all land management agencies. We have um, kept fire out of the ecosystem and now we're paying for it. Uh, we thought that was the right thing to do at the time. We we're learning differently. I don't think it's a matter of being irresponsible. I think it's a matter of, of the, how much science we knew about uh, fire ecology and we know a lot more today than we used to. I would agree with that, but, but there are those who also believe that uh Never in the history of these agencies has there been as much uh, influence from non-scientists who are in powerful policy-making decisions. Uh, I mean, these have been agencies that have been run by science over the years. Many feel in the last few years they've veered from science to political agendas and, and that the Forest Service and Interior have not been able to manage that it's... it's, it's uh, Sound science has been, had been moved away from, and we're finding that that didn't work. That hasn't been an, an issue in fire. You don't think policies from leaders of this country have had an impact on preventing catastrophic fires? What you have to understand is that the Forest Service is not out here by itself um, in making these calls and establishing these priorities. I think the 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 fire business amongst the agencies is probably one of the best 
models of how this should work. And it works very, very well. Well, I would agree with you once we have the fire. M many people do not agree with you in preventing those fires. So I'll conclude with that. Ms. McDougall, I'm, I'm going to continue in that line of questioning because we do have some very specific concerns about how the U.S. Forest Service reacts um, in its decision-making processes with those who are on the ground, those who are at the site of the fire, and the decisions that are made. And I do want to read the following questions because they were questions that were submitted to me by Congressman Tilly Fowler, whose district also was impacted very heavily by the fires. And this, and this goes to the line of questioning um, that Mr. Peterson was involved in, uh, and that is the Forest Service activities and decision making on the ground when the fire is in process. Ms. Fowler submitted the following question. During the Florida fires, a super scooper aircraft, a Can Canadair a CL-215 firefighting aircraft was sent down from North Carolina to help fight the fires. And unfortunately, this asset was not properly used during the Florida fires. Although it was able to successfully complete over nine drops of water each hour, it was that the, that the aircraft is historically used, it was only used efficiently for one day. It spent three days on the ground and at least one day flying on the same schedule as the slower tankers. Why was this firefighting aircraft used so inefficiently? That's question number one. And the fires began on Memorial Day weekend and the super scooper was not brought into those fires until a month later where it only had to come from North Carolina. What was the reason for the delay in requesting this aircraft and bringing it down to Florida? And then finally, although the company that makes these aircraft is based in Canada, it does have production facilities in the United States. And we should, as a matter of fact, be able to use any aircraft available to us that would um, be more responsive in terms of its capabilities in putting out large fires, like the one that we've been referring to in the wilderness areas. There seems, there, there seem to be, to uh, Ms. Mrs. Uh, Fowler and to the people in Florida, they, and, and the reports that, that the congressmen there have gotten, it seemed to be some resistance from the Forest Service to bringing in these aircraft to fight the fires. Now, if this is the case, what are the reasons behind the objection to the use of this aircraft? Madam Chairman, I'm going to let Denny Truesdale um, help respond to that since he was down there All working right. with them. But I'd like to say that uh, I had several personal um, conversations with Ms. Fowler, not specific to the Super Scooper, but to um, uh, the availability to um, of helicopters. And um, I immediately called the incident commander and said, talk to this lady. And, and he did. So um, we were responsive to her in a number of ways. But as to, and I know that the state forester um, for Florida was the one who initially requested the, the super scooper. And therein may lay the problem. Um, so, Mr. Truesdale, please proceed. Thank you. I tried to take notes as we went down through these questions, but if I miss one, please refresh my memory as we go I through will. here. The first question, I believe, regarded the efficiency or, in uh, the congressperson's words, the inefficiency when she asked the question. That was a very complex situation down there in Florida. I have talked to the state forester, Earl Peterson, and I believe, according to his information, that there was more aircraft, firefighting aircraft, in the state of Florida working at one time than it has ever occurred in the history of firefighting within the state. 
combine that under the situation with extreme smoky conditions, the weather conditions that make it very difficult to fly, and inefficiencies of all kinds of aircraft, whether they're the helicopters are large retardant bombers that we use extensively in the West, the small single engine air tankers, which uh, would be similar to crop duster aircraft, those sorts of things that are used throughout the East uh, uh, very effectively. And so inefficiencies are bound to occur under those situations because of the inability to fly. The uh, aircraft itself had some difficulty getting pilots that were approved by FAA to fly in the U.S. and I believe uh, FEMA was able to, through some of their authorities, work with the FAA and get those pilots certified to work in, the, in Florida for that emergency and that took a few days in the delay. We believe that the uh, mix of aircraft which was ordered by the incident commanders on the ground, both federal, state, and local firefighters, needs to match the local conditions there, and we had that full range of aircraft there, including the, the loan from the super scooper from North Carolina. We still had many other aircraft available in the West that, because of the congestion of the airspace there, we were unable to move into Florida, and we feel that the uh, Canadian aircraft, and if I may, is a good product that in some circumstances has a very effective use in places in the United States. And it is used within the United States in various circumstances. Thank you, Mr. Truesdale. I'm not sure that we got the answer that, that we were looking for the, that, um, with regards to how the question was framed. It seems only logical that if um, uh, air congestion of, of a number of uh, aircraft was the question, if you have one aircraft that can do 10 times the work of other smaller aircraft, that we would utilize that one aircraft, especially when we have a wilderness area, for instance, it's on fire. We can only fight it from the air. There's 24,000 acres that ultimately were lost. This appears to be the situation of, uh, of maybe some turf battles. I hope that didn't happen, but it gives every appearance of being. So for us, for the American people, Mr. Truesdale, I would love it if, no, I wouldn't just love it, I would ask that you submit to this committee and to Mrs. Fowler and the rest of the congressional delegation a complete report on how aircraft were deployed and utilized, who was in uh, control, who were making the command decisions down there, and who was cooperating with whom in terms of how the federal and the state foresters were cooperating with one another. It will be very instructive to us in the future because I hear the same complaints in, in Boise sometimes. Aircraft are, are brought in and, and they're embargoed right there in in, in Boise, and uh, they cannot be used by their owners for other purposes, and they sit on the ground. And so this would be a, a very uh, good opportunity to bring more understanding um, as to the problem that Mrs. Fowler has pointed out, and it will enable all of us to be able to avoid that problem in the future. And even though it is a Canadian aircraft that that should have been uh, very little reason for it to, to, be, uh, to be used only a minimal amount of time. And it should have been um, very little reason for it to have taken a month for it to be called from North Carolina. So naturally, the committee has questions about it. And uh, so we do look forward to a more detailed report. Do you have any uh, comments with regards to the detailed report that this chairman is asking for? No, first of all, we will be happy to respond to your request. We are in the process with the state agencies, the other agencies that respond, of looking at the entire mobilization down there, the process that uh, brought the people from throughout the United States, as well as the Individual, some of the individual fires, and we will add that into our list of uh, items that we need to review and report back to you. I, 
I probably was not very clear in, in some of my earlier statement here, and let me add just one more comment. Even though the CL215 is an aircraft, uh, an airplane, uh, it is most comparable in firefighting use with the large helicopters, the Sikorskys, the Sky Cranes, the what we call Type 1 or heavy lift helicopters. They drop at approximately the same speed, although helicopters can actually hover, although that can be unsafe at some times. They usually maintain some forward speed. But they fly slowly. They have very quick turnaround times. They can use the same water sources that the super scoopers use. They're much more maneuverable and in many cases more effective in the wildland urban interface than our aircraft because they can be directed a little bit, uh, I probably should say more precisely because of their ability to fly so slowly. And my comparison with the uh, need for the incident commanders to make a decision on the type of aircraft was a trade-off or a similar category of dropping ability between Type 1 helicopters and the Canadian aircraft. The Type 1 helicopters, we have, I don't know what the numbers are, but 20, 30, 40 on contract throughout the United States. The, there were numerous Type 1 helicopters in the state of Florida dropping both for the Forest Service on federal fires, for the state on state protected fires, and I think they were also used on cooperatively with the counties. So our comparison would be more with the Type 1 helicopter than with our 3,000, 2,000 gallon uh, water uh, retardant aircraft. Well, thank you, Mr. Truesdale, and I would look forward to receiving that report within 30 days. Is there? Uh, is we that all right? can. We will get you a report within 30 days. The completeness and the specificity that you asked for, I'm not certain that all the reviews will be completed by that time, but we, within 30 days, we will let you know the status of, of the information that we have, yes. Within 30 days, I would like to see in the report um, the, the evidence that you have worked with the State Forester in trying to find out where the breakdown was or what is perceived as a breakdown. So um, I, I would like to see in that report within 30 days uh, the fact that you have coordinated with the state and, and what your report is. I will also be working through Mr. Boyd to, to uh, receive a like report from, from the uh, state forester. So would you be willing to assist the committee in that, Mr. Boyd? Uh, Absolutely, Madam Chairman. Uh, All right. Um, I, I have a couple more questions. Uh, it's been mentioned in the newspaper, Mrs. Fowler also wanted us to mention this, that perhaps the command structure for fighting the fires was in a state of confusion throughout some of the time the fires were burning and that communication between coordinating agencies was not all that it should be during an emergency situation. Um, this was her last um, comment, and uh, I do would expect that in the report you will be able to respond to these concerns and what we can do in the future to improve it. Now going back to, uh, to some of my questions, I have two questions for you. Um, what role did we play this year in the fires in Mexico and last year in the fires in Indonesia, Ms. McDougall? Well, Denny Truesdale accompanied uh, a group down there, so I would like for him to speak to that. All right. The, uh, I'll go back to Indonesia first, since that I did not accompany a group to Indonesia, but the uh, assistance to Indonesia was a combination of uh, Department of Defense, U.S. military assets, uh, aircraft, the C-130s, and uh, MAFS units, which are, and I didn't come prepared with the acronym, but it's Mobile, uh, mobile Aviation Firefighting Systems or something. It's the uh, systems that, are slid, that slide into the C-130s that drop retardant, which makes uh, cargo-carrying aircraft retardant aircraft. And we supplied a few technical experts, some personnel to assist the Indonesian government in utilizing those aircraft. And uh, I believe that was the extent. We may have provided some other technical advice, but that is, pra for practical purposes, that was the assistance to Indonesia. What about the fire in Mexico this year? The, the fire in Mexico this year uh, 
was uh, a little more extensive. The Mexican government requested uh, technical experts in uh, the same issue we've just been talking about, the use of helicopters and aviation resources to fight fires, in assisting with planning uh, fire detection and uh, mapping, that sort of thing, and then the use of the incident command system and the coordination process we use to manage fires. We sent approximately, and when I say we, it's the interagency wildfire community. These included state of Texas employees, state of New Mexico employees, Department of Interior employees, not just the Forest Service. We sent approximately 100 people to Mexico over about a six-week period to assist them. The fires in Mexico, while related to the fires in Florida because of the commonality of weather, extreme drought, and uh, uh, the fact that fires hadn't occurred for, I believe, Florida in 50 years. This is the worst that uh, Mr. Boyd stated. The uh, same is true with Mexico, except that in the states of Chiapas and Oaxaca and some of the area down there, fires had never re occurred to that extent in the history of uh, the people down there. Uh, there's a wide <coughs> range of reasons for that that I'm not an expert on. But uh, because of the remoteness of the area, unlike Florida, Chiapas and Oaxaca is extremely mountainous, extremely remote, and the use of helicopters was needed to get people to the fires, and the use of our infrared mapping aircraft was necessary to assist the Mexican and the Guatemalan government in simply even locating where the fires were. Did we deploy um, personnel down there like our hotshots? No. Uh, Mexi all of the firefighting firefighters, the people like the hotshot crews that uh, go out and actually fight the fire were Mexicans. They did not request any assistance for us for firefighters, just the technical assistance in those activities already described. Uh, Mr. Trud Trusdale, I will address this question to you or uh, Ms. McDougall, whomever wished to answer it. Um, our hotshot crews are the pride of the Forest Service, and as you know, um, hotshot crews were deployed out of Boise uh, the NIFC into Florida even mm -hmm. and as you know the Boise hotshot crew which is in my mind the premier of the premiers was put on hold and I've got a lot of my hotshots uh, in Boise counting needles on trees and, and doing landscape gridding and I'm not one ha bit happy about it I'm a very unhappy camper about that and um, I do want um, assurance from you, Ms. McDougall, that our Boise Hotshot crew will be up and operating um, full speed uh, again uh, in a very short period of time. I'd like to know how soon we're going to get them up and operating and get those very highly skilled and highly trained men back doing what they've been trained to do instead of counting needles and, and laying out uh, landscape grids. We believe that they will be back next year. Uh, we don't think that uh, we can do it any sooner than that. And as I understand that the investigations are still ongoing. So we have to let that play out and then we can regroup. You know, let me just say for the record that this is very frustrating for me. There was uh, an incident that could have been a criminal violation that happened between a couple of people. But that is absolutely no excuse for doing away with one of the best hotshot crews in the nation. The program should go on while the investigation with regards to the conduct of two people who probably or may have conducted themselves inappropriately, that investigation should go on uninterrupted. And I have given, I have given the Forest Service several months time um, and, and have urged the Congress to stay out of this. But I am growing increasingly impatient if I continue to hear that because of an ongoing <coughs> investigation, because of the um, violation that two people were involved in, uh, that that is not sufficient reason to give me, not to give me dates specific and times uh, and to the degree that we're going to see this very, very important hotshot crew reinstituted. I, I, I am, as you can tell, growing increasingly impatient. I, I want to know dates. I want to know when those people are going to be back to work doing what they've been trained for. When will you have that answer for me? 
Last time I asked for direct answers, I said close of business by tomorrow or I'm going to have subpoenas ready. I'm not prepared to do that yet, but I'm getting awful close. Because, you know, Boise has had a, a tremendous amount of fire. We have an area there that 600,000 acres have burned. And, and, you know, the Boise foothills threaten, uh, fires on the Boise foothills threaten our homes every other year. So... Well, Madam Chairman, I, I believe that we had been responses, responsive to your capability in Idaho. We have uh, uh, supplemented what you had there. No, it isn't the hotshot crew, but in terms of the equipment and the people that we have deployed to your state, uh, for this fire season, I thought that you were satisfied with what we've done today. I, I now, have been satisfied to date. I, but I, you know, I do want to open it up again to find out when it is that we will have these people back on duty. I understand, and I'm not, I'm not convinced that it is to people. I don't know the how this is going to turn out. I don't know who or if anybody's going to be indicted. I know that it's out of our hands. It's in the Justice Department. We have no control over it. Um, so I'm not comfortable at this point in time and, and, um, and moving ahead with that until I have some assurances that I'm doing the right thing with the right people. And that's all that I'm saying. Ms. I understand your, your desire and I believe that we can be uh, responsive to it in the way that that you desire but I'm just not comfortable right now because I don't know how this is going to play out I have no idea I just I just want us together as a Congress and as an agency to always keep the goal in mind and I think we'd have to agree on the fact that government's ultimate responsibility is to make sure that necessary services are fulfilled and necessary services being fighting fire and when we see skilled people who are not under indictment being laid off to count needles on trees um, that that does not make me very sanguine at all I understand. and so um, the program has to go on and and Ms. McDougal, I know you share that with me Yes, the fact that that necessary program must go on so I look forward to staying in touch with you okay. and your staff on that um, I will be as happy we proceed. to yes. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, I would like to ask the um, The gentleman from Colorado if he has any other questions Briefly the gentleman from Florida <laughs> Please proceed okay. Thank you. Uh, Ms. McDougal, do you agree with the press accounts that forest roads greatly assisted in the suppression of fires in Florida? I'm sorry. Do you I... agree with the press accounts that, that forest roads greatly assisted with the fighting of the fires that we had in Florida? I don't know that. I have not seen those press accounts, but okay. we do. We are well, aware that that access to fires is very important, yeah. Okay, Mr. Truesdale is shaking his head yes. I guess that means that you agree with that, those press accounts. Yeah, again, I'm not for familiar with the specific ones, but roads are a very effective barrier many times in fighting fires. Having seen the, the partially uh, seen the uh, fires in the Osceola uh, National Forest, uh, I can assure you that they were the key in uh, us mm -hmm. preventing the spread of that into, into private lands and into uh, populated areas. Ms. McDougall, I've had some dis many discussions or discussions with Mr. Peterson, who is our state mm -hmm. forester, uh, with your people, uh, Ms. Carney, mm -hmm. uh, who is your state forester in in, Flo in the National Forest of Florida, uh, the people who came in from other states, the local firefighters, and uh, I think in overall that uh, most everybody agrees that the coordinated effort that was made in Florida was good and I want to I, I want to lay that out uh, that that we feel that way I think any time that you do uh, that you experience uh, have a new experience and for the in Florida that was something new for us we haven't had uh, a spread of wildfires like of that magnitude in Florida since since I can remember in my lifetime uh, so we, we're breaking new ground down there 
And any time you break new ground, obviously you make some mistakes. And obviously you want to, to uh, evaluate uh, what happened and how you can do it better next time. And I've had this discussion with Mr. Peterson. As a matter of fact, Mr. Peterson came before this committee last week. And overall, he gave high marks to the coordinated efforts that were done in Florida. And, and a lot of that was uh, done through your office and the folks that, uh, that work for you. However, he did say that he felt that, uh, that better coordination uh, could be uh, done in the area of equipment to ordering and placement and that kind of thing, and, and that there was an ongoing uh, uh, evaluation with your folks. Also, uh, long-range planning in, in order to more effectively pre-position people and equipment particularly when, when we got into the situation where fire started breaking out, and I've had these discussions with Ms. Carney, and it's something I think that you all have learned, and I'm sure that's going to be a part of your, your uh, evaluation process and your, and your report. And so I won't ask you any questions about that. I, I think that you all, I'm sure that you all will have that evaluation process done, and, and you'll get a report to us, and, and it will be, uh, it'll be a very positive thing for all of us. Rehab efforts, so I want to talk about rehab efforts, rehabilitation. Mr. Peterson stated before this committee that rehabilitation efforts on state lands had begun even prior to the time that all the fires were out. Salvage timber sales, for example, were already being prepared and he was about to let uh, bids on salvage timber sales. What is the status of rehab efforts on our, na on our national lands? We sent a team down uh, yesterday, in fact, to take a look, our, our technical experts on that, uh, to take a look at it. I think Osceola is probably the only one where there could be some salvage opportunities, but we don't know that yet. We'll be meeting with uh, um, our forest employees and Marsha Kearney, who is the forest supervisor for the National Forest of Florida, uh, as well as Earl Peterson to come up with some some assessment on, on uh, salvage opportunities. Well, I think that's a, that's a pretty good uh, up, uh, analysis of, the, of an update because I talked to uh, Mr. Lawrence, who's a Osceola National Forest forester, uh, mm -hmm. probably 10 days ago. This was mm -hmm. after all the fires were out. And he explained to me at that time that uh, August 3rd would be the date the assessment team came in. That was yesterday. Mm -hmm. You said they mm -hmm. went in. Mm -hmm. It would take them at least a week to 10 days to do their work. And then we had the NEPA process to go through. I, I can tell you, Ms. McDougall, that in Florida, when all that's done and said and done 60 days from now, there won't be any need for any salvage rehabilitation effort because the timber will be of no value uh, because that's the way it is in the southeast. With our high humidity, we get the blue stain and, and it's... It, you know, we hadn't started this process. The fires have been out for a month now. Uh, we're, we're today beginning our assessment. We're going to do that assessment for 10 days, and then we're going to go through a 45-day a, a NEPA process. And then, you know, we might as well not have done all that. Uh, so my question to you is, is there something to be learned from this? Can we, can we work together to uh, change this process somehow or another so that that uh, we, the, the rehabilitation effort will mean something to us? Well, I don't know if the process needs changing or if we need to uh, better engage those who have regulatory authority over some of these things like we did for the Texas blowdown effort and others. Um, there, there was some um, real partnership that occurred with, for example, CEQ and and the Forest Service uh, uh, in that effort. And that was a forest health issue, and, and it worked. So um, I think you just need to get the folks you need to get involved, involved as soon as possible, and work something out that's meaningful. Uh, we do have red cockaded woodpecker habitat down there that's, that's been destroyed. There is a need to move urgently, if that's at all possible. But I understand that the market's uh, bottomed out down there. Well, the, the market's on the pulpwood side of bottomed out, and probably there's not much there. But on the salt timber side, uh, and of course the pulpwood can stand for a long period of time, mm -hmm. uh, as you know, or may, may or may not know. But on the salt timber side, that's where our timing is of the essence. 
And the markets are still holding up pretty good because we can move that to pretty far away uh, well, at reasonable we're cost. So I, my question to you is, who is it? And you suggested that we work with the appropriate people. Tell first, me who the appropriate first people are. We, first, we need to wait for the assessment to be completed to see what they really need. I don't know when, that yet. When will the assessment be completed? They're working on it now. I don't know. I can get back to you with that. Okay. Mr. Lawrence told me to take a week. Is that a... Is I, that it, I won't second judge that. I okay. don't know. It just depends on how much they're looking at. So then next week sometimes we could get back together and figure out who it, we need to go to to we need, uh, we expedite. Can, we can give you some sense of how long it's going to take to finish that this okay. week. So we can do that. Thank you very much. Mr. Schaefer. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I want to follow up on, on that quickly, because in addition to the 60 days of, of assessment and evaluation that goes on is, is this administrative appeals process that I mentioned in our last round of questioning, because that's, that's the next stage that tie, tends to tie up uh, um, salvage operations or timber sales and so on. And the appeals process, the duration has nothing to do with how many appeals there, there may be. It is a consistent process in every single case. You know, when this timber is, is dead or, or is dying, uh, the time for analysis, decisions, and the, the appeals, and sometimes the litigation that, is, uh, the, the, that you pile on top of that can be so long that you lose any, any value in, in the timber. Do you, uh, just let me ask, do you, do you agree with that? Pre previously you said you didn't agree or you didn't, didn't believe that the administrative appeals process had any impact on the, on the, uh, uh, the ability to, to, to treat damaged um, acreage. And so I, I, you've heard a, a, an immediate example in Florida. And again, and that, that in, in uh, uh, Congressman Boyd's example, didn't really contemplate the appeals process that some environmental group, I guarantee, is going to uh, to come and, and uh, submit because they uh, somebody I'm, I'm sure thinks that uh, cinder coated pieces of wood out in the middle of a, a dead forest is somehow useful and needs to stay as, as it is. But once that occurs, um, you're talking about I, I don't know how many months, but a long, long time. Um, and I, I want to ask you one more time: Do you believe that there is some uh, some need to to review or evaluate the appeals process? at the administrative level? I don't, I don't think you should look at the appeals process in and of itself um, alone as a standard. No, okay, let me just stop you there because we agree on that point and I don't know if anybody suggested we should look at it in and of itself. I'm talking about the total duration of time and in, in, in immediate evaluation which can take up to 60 days the, including the NEPA process and then an appeals process uh, established that, that exists beyond that. So, so let's not look at it in and of itself. Let's look at it in, 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 to, in its totality. The Secretary of Agriculture already has a committee of scientists uh, taking a look at recommendations to totally overhaul our planning process. I presume that that is one of the things that they're looking at as well, although I have not seen the result of their work. They are slated to be done in a couple of months, I believe, but I'm not absolutely sure on that. I think early fall they will have completed their work and uh, I would suggest that we give that process an opportunity to play out to see if, if they've done something for us. Let me move on to some other questions. And that is, um, you know, I, w I would like to get a sense for where we are headed with budget requests, with budget outlays, and what is the value of a dollar we spend in your agency on suppression and, and, uh, and uh, uh, preparedness uh, for, for the public. And our, our Let's talk in terms of trends. Where, where do you see the conditions across the country? Uh, are we, it's my sense that, that we are seeing more volatile lands, um, more conducive to, uh, to wildfires. Uh, do you agree with that assessment? I've just testified that we believe we have about 40 million acres okay. that are at high risk catastrophic fire. Is, is that more than the previous year, or more than previous years, if you can take a look at where we've headed over a longer period of time? It, we, are re going, we are in the process now refining that number. It could be more, it could be less. I don't know yet. 
Have we done these kinds of analysis five years ago, three years ago? Not as well as we're doing them now. So do we have any sense whether there are more or less volatile uh, 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 wildlands that are susceptible for, to wildfires uh, today than, let's just say, last year? We have a better sense of where they are. Uh, well, what is that sense? Intermountain West. No, I mean, I mean what, what is the sense of, of which direction we're headed? Are, 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 are national forests becoming more volatile, susceptible to wildfires, or less? Well, I, I would say that um, probably more because fields are continuing to build up. Is there any, uh, has there ever been any effort to try to quantify the value of the, for the 40 million acres, for example? I, I know how many acres that is, but in terms of the value of that, those acres uh, to the American people, not just in the, the resource value, but also in the cost of, uh, of putting out wildfires in those areas. Has there ever been any kind of analysis? If we spend a dollar up front, how much are we going to save, potentially, in the, in the coming year? Okay. If I may, sir, the part of our analysis that we use in our budget that uh, Mr. Josephson talked about also for the Department of Interior uses a model that gives us a benefit cost of protecting the national forests. And the benefit is that if we're at the most efficient level organization, if we put a dollar, if we spend a dollar on protection, the pre-suppression organization, we are saving a dollar in suppression cost and resource damages. And that model has been used uh, for 10, 15 years in order to determine a, an efficient level of budgeting for our pre-suppression organization. So we do the benefit cost from that sort of side of it. In, in terms of various agencies, different federal agencies, state agencies, and private lands, do we have any kind of a, a, uh, an, an analysis of where our fire, our wildfire problems are, are worse and where they seem to be more easily contained or controlled or, or maybe prevented <coughs> altogether? A combination of things with the 40 million acres that Janice just described the, that's at risk, uh, the uh, individual fire histories, most areas including states uh, and some uh, local organizations have fire history maps that they have in, used uh, to determine uh, lightning patterns, for example, or patterns for, uh, that become obvious when you look at them, but where the roads go through the forest where people have access, where fires may start, where people live, where the wildland urban interface is, Fires tend How to start. about on we an have agency by agency basis? And the reason I ask, I'll, I'll stop because I've expired my, uh, my allotted time here. This subcommittee went, uh, did a field hearing in Idaho and Oregon, and one of the things that was, made a big impression on me was that I didn't realize that forest fires sometimes stop along a straight line. And the only difference between where the fire burned intensely and where it stopped was that the Forest Service owned the land that burned to the ground and private interests owned the land that is still green. And what it suggests to me is that there is, and right, right along the property line is where the fire stops. And, um, and what it suggests to me is that, is that your job changes from property owner to property owner across the country. So this 40 million acres, can you tell me whether, this is, whether, whether the majority of these acres are federal lands and whether they're managed by the Forest Service or BLM or some other federal agency or by the state, uh, state forest services or state held lands or whether it's uh, uh, possibly owned by, by private lands. Uh, my, my sense, without having done the research, is that, is that uh, the, uh, the, the greatest risk of wildfires is, is on federal lands, uh, federally managed lands. Um, and I guess I want to get a sense of whether I'm, I'm close to the mark or, or whether that, we know that, that at all. 40 million acres is Forest Service lands only. So this uh, is all forest that you've estimated here? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Step away from the 40 million then and just to, uh, in, in terms of where our, our greatest risks of wildfires across the country are, do we know which categories of ownership those lands fall into? Well, if you look at the state of Florida, for example, the risk that was occurred over the past two or three months 
if you use acreage, 12.5% was National Forest Systems land and the rest was state and private or perhaps some other federal lands down there. But the majority in Florida impacted state and private landowners instead of National Forest Systems. In the West, uh, probably just in some parts of your state, for example, where the majority of a particular area is federal land, then the risk would be higher on the federal. But in Florida, the risk was highest on the state lands. And to add to that, um, the state of Florida has uh, one of the most aggressive fuels treatment programs in the country. Uh, Florida burns uh, about two million acres a year. Um, to give you some sense of, of Forest Service, for instance, you know, we burn about um, 1.2 million acres a year nationwide. Florida burns about two and still um, they had this problem. Had they not had this aggressive uh, fuels uh, effort ongoing in the state, it could have been a lot worse than it was. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Peterson. Uh, Mr. Trisdale, uh, would you share with the committee uh, the value of our volunteers and how we can help them. I agree with a State Forester from Virginia that they are an extremely valuable part of the fire protection throughout the United States. <coughs> we, from a federal agency standpoint, rely on them also as partners in fighting fires on National Forest Systems lands. The Department of the Interior, I know Wally will say the same thing, uses uh, volunteer and state organizations. And we've found that they've been very effective as the initial attack on many, many wildland fires uh, throughout the wildland urban interface, even on, even on federal lands. What do we currently do to help them? Be, be prepared and equipped uh, because they're really, you know, where they're, well, next week I'm going to be meeting, or the next two weeks at, at some point in time, as soon as I get a clear date, I'm going to be meeting with 20 volunteer fire departments that, that, that protect the ANF. And uh, they're looking for help. What should I tell them? The two programs that were outlined uh, in the uh, GAO report that provide assistance, uh, one primarily to the state forester to assist in uh, developing the training, uh, communications, tr uh, equipment, those sorts of things for the organizations and the rural volunteer fire program. A, uh, a, a program that specifically funds small volunt rural volunteer fire departments. The, the federal excess personal property program where those groups are able through the state forester, and I apologize, I don't know your state forester, but he runs a very good program, I'm sure, to manage that program that brings as federal assets down to those volunteer areas. I think those are some of the best uh, programs that we have at our disposal to assist those folks in not only the training and education to help them make that transition from a structural fire department to a wildland, but also to get the equipment, which is different. I believe Ms. Brown, uh, in her statement, said one of the biggest problems they had in Florida, or maybe not the biggest, but one of the problems they experienced in Florida were the structural fire fighters that, in many cases that you're speaking of, did not have the lightweight Nomex fire protection clothing that they should have had for fighting wildland fires. And those making that transition to uh, not just simply use their structural protection equipment, but have specialized training, that, that's a very big help to those areas. So the state forester administers all those programs? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, back to the issue of, of prevention. Uh, the Forest Service, I'll use as an example, I don't have the numbers from the other agency, but uh, uh, you used to cut about 12 billion board feet a year, uh, and you had about plus salvage, which was two to three billion board feet, that's what I've been told. Uh, currently, you're cutting about three billion board feet a year, which includes salvage. And people tell me that, that we really don't cut much green timber anymore. It's uh, salvage dominates the program. And, but I guess the question I want to ask with, with that direction we're heading, do you really have the ability to thin out uh, forests that are overcrowded and, and uh, impacted by insects and disease and drought? 
We're currently working on a, an effort to, to do just that, to deal with that issue as well as the fuels issue. Um, the problem is we've done all the easy stuff and what's left in there is the small diameter wood that, um, that we don't have good markets for. Our Madison, uh, Wisconsin lab is working, has done a lot of work, for instance, in Southeast Alaska with the communities to develop, help them develop markets for uh, the small diameter wood. And um, we're putting together for our, as we work on our FY2000 budget, um, a, a real initiative, we believe, not only to, to um, deal with the forest health issue, but to create jobs in these communities. But, but still, my, my question was a little different than that. I ask you, with, the, with your cut being about 3 billion board feet a year and, and your average salvage, that's after the fact. That's where timbers died for some reason, or dying is about, has historically been there. Does that allow you, the uh, amount of timber you're cutting per year, does that allow you to thin forests that need thinned? In addition to that, sure, if we get the budgets to do so. But you don't, if, you're not getting them pre presently. Well, I don't know well, that. You don't, you don't. I don't know that. Well, how about last year? Well, last year we did not have this initiative and um, we have been involving the administration in the development of it and so we think that there will be support this time. Mr. Josephson, um, would you like to speak BLM land and interior? I'd have to defer to the BLM. If you could ask that question, we'd be glad to get back with an answer. Would you get that information for me? Yes, I will. Okay. Um, I have no further questions. Um, in follow-up with Mr. Peterson's line of questioning, we um, actually in the Congress we have increased Forest Service funding every year. And so I urge uh, those of you who have to take the hard questions here in this committee to uh, uh, look to your in administrative heads to make sure that the money we allocate is properly spent on those very necessary programs. Um, it's not always easy to be here in front of the committee when the buck stops with you. But uh, I, I appreciate your candid answers and uh, I look forward to uh, to receiving your reports. I do want to say, uh, Mr. Josephson, I'm not going to let you off the hook. I do have some questions for you. Your expertise is in fuels management and, and fire, isn't it? Wildland fire, that's right. Wildland fires. I do want to say that in, in Idaho, right where we have the National uh, Interagency Fire Command Center, uh, that deploys uh, information as well as personnel and equipment all over the United States and in some, sometimes when it's required beyond our borders, uh, we have a situation that is developing that I mentioned earlier that has required our former Secretary of the Interior Cecil Andrus and former Governor Cecil Andrus to take um, to the airwaves with uh, BLM uh, public service spots uh, admonishing people that because we have 400 percent fuel load in the cheat grass to be very careful about making sure that there is no human caused fire. Well, that's good, but that's only a small part of the problem. Number one, we do have a 400 percent fuel load in, in that cheat grass um, that not only uh, occupies the landscape south and east and west of Boise, but also north where uh, fires that start can uh, move very quickly into private land and as we have seen in the past move on to public uh, Federal Forest Service land. So when I was back there this weekend um, we had the oddity of having um, rainstorms uh, in August in Boise which is normally very arid and dry. But when we have dry rainstorm or thunderstorms move through uh, our areas, we take an awful lot of, of lightning strikes. And that's when so many of our fires are started in that cheatgrass area. Now, cheatgrass, as you know, contains a certain chemical composition and, and a certain oil that when it burns, once it dries out, it burns very, very hot. And, 
and winds uh, begin to perpetuate its own weather system because of the fire. And so uh, it, it becomes a massive fire. As you know, Mr. J Josephson, when fire begins on federal land, um, if it moves to state land or to private land, there is no liability on the part of the federal government as to whether they have properly tried to contain the fire early on in order to prevent it moving on to someone else's land. But if fire st starts on private land or state land, if it moves into the federal land, then the federal government has been given the authority to hold those people liable who did not contain the fire properly when it was on their private land or state land. That seems to be uh, a situation that was, is way, way out of balance. So with that in mind, Mr. Josephson, isn't it, wouldn't it be advisable for the secretary to be given the authority to control those fuel loads while they're still controllable. For instance, in the interface between urban and, and wildland areas, wouldn't it be advisable for the Secretary of Interior to be given the authority by Congress to uh, take care of those fuel loads, either by mowing or grazing or plowing fuel brakes or whatever it is around areas so that fire would not move from the federal land onto other land. So fire will not move so quickly that we lose lives like we did um, a couple years ago. Uh, would you agree that that is a proper authority to be given from this Congress to the Secretary? I believe the authority is already at the uh, local level that they can do interface work with local communities, and if that includes uh, plowing around the communities or doing prescribed burns in the local areas, that is an option they can do at this time. Perhaps they can, but it has not been spelled out clearly enough in the law that they are willingly using it, and that's why we've seen the destructive fires in that very area that contains the National Interagency Fire Command Center. I, I mean, it's, it's just ironic that right there in Boise, Idaho, we've had tremendously destructive fires. And so because it has not been spelled out perfectly clearly that the Secretary has this authority to make those on-the-ground decisions, it has not been done. And so therefore we've lost property and we have lost lives uh, with fires that began in those flatlands where there was a high fuel load of cheatgrass. And this year we are, we are naturally very concerned because of the 400% increase in, in, in the uh, growth of cheatgrass. And it has not been contained when it could have been in the springtime, either by mowing or grazing or whatever it might be that the secretary determines would be the m proper method to control the fuel load. So would you be willing to work with the Congress and um, a lot of people nationwide who are interested in making sure that that, inter that interface is protected? Would the BLM be willing to work with us on, on achieving that goal? Yes, we would be willing to work with you to protect the uh, local communities and to control the uh, fuel load that does build up uh, in large part because of weather, either drought conditions or heavier than normal uh, water years when we have a heavier fuel load. But will you work with us to control those yes. uh, fuels? Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Josephson. And before I close the hearing, I, I want to yield for another question from Mr. Boyd. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and again, let me thank you for holding this hearing, and I'm glad that uh, you had those questions. So, Mr. Josephson, I certainly didn't want him to feel like he'd been slighted by this panel, <laughs> this day of questioning, but uh, Ms. McDougall, I have one final question and that before we, we do close. Can you tell me that the United States Forest Service will seek alternative authorities for the Florida fire like they did in Texas? No, I can't tell you that because I don't know what the need is yet. I, I have to wait until the field people identify them and then we'll take a look and see what's needed to do that. But I have not seen what they've identified yet. It has not been submitted. I assure you 
that I will get back with you later on this week and let you know when we can expect something. Okay, so that's the assessment team that's in there now yes. doing that work that went in yesterday that, that Mr. Lawrence told me should take a week or so. Yes. Okay, uh, okay that, I, I, that's, a, that's a reasonable answer. And if you would, uh, if we could communicate later in the week uh, as that assessment team does its work, uh, that would be helpful because I'd like to uh, work with you uh, okay. to do what's best uh, for the health of that uh, national forest. Understood. And if that includes uh, salvage effort, efforts before the, those, those stems rot, then I, I'd like to be able to help you do that. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I want to thank the panelists very much for your valuable time. Uh, we have ha held you here for a long time. This has become an issue that is no longer just con contained in the uh, Pacific Northwest or the Southwest, but is now a nationwide problem. And so we probably come together more often and for longer extended periods of time than, than we had hoped for. But again, thank you for your time. I look forward to the reports being submitted um, to us. And uh, I do want to remind the witnesses that, uh, uh, if, that we will have additional questions for you that we will submit in writing. And the record will remain open for 10 working days should you wish to add anything to your testimony. With that, again, I want to thank you. And uh, the hearing is now, thank you. now thank you. adjourned. <laughs>some of the guests scheduled for Washington Journal for the rest of this week. Tomorrow we'll welcome Republican Congressman Greg Gansky and John Boehner. On Friday, California Democrat Vic Fazio will join us. Washington Journal begins weekdays at 7 a.m. Eastern on our companion network C-SPAN. The Social Democratic Party candidate for German Chancellor Gerhard Schroeder 